Um, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to let people know uh, what to expect tonight. We've um, the school board has invited Dr. Josh White to give us a medical perspective on what's going on uh, right here and right now in the Randolph area. Um, so he's going to start. We will have a brief uh, public comment period or question and answer for him after that. Brief though, and then we're going to get give Lane an opportunity to um, let us know uh, what uh, he and the cabinet are thinking uh, going forward um, as far as educational modalities uh, can be um, expected. Uh, I do want to ask during the public comment session after Lane's presentation, though, that people keep their comments short. Um, and I'm requesting that people refrain from commenting more than once. That's I've been remiss in um, asking people to keep um, one comment uh, uh, so that lots of people, other people can have a turn to speak or comment themselves. So um, I think that would give us the opportunity to hear from more people um, who would like to, to question or comment. So uh, we've got 171 people on this call. There's lots of people listening. And uh, we, as a school board, really want to thank Josh White for agreeing to give us an overview of where he and the hospital and the medical community think uh, our community is right now, right here. Thanks, Josh. Laura, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. So uh, I got a, a few brief comments uh, to provide an update on the, the current state of affairs, um, what we expect, um, some brief commentary on the upcoming vaccine <clears throat> and uh, considerations as far as what we know on schools. Uh, and afterwards, I'll open that up to questions. Um, currently, Vermont is, uh, um, for those of you not living under a rock, well into the throes of the second surge. Um, uh, on the 5th, we had 120 new cases, and, and those numbers have been fairly consistent as of late. Uh, my expectation is that we are uh, at the peak or nearing the peak of the second surge, and ultimately what we are seeing is the product of fatigue, uh, people are tired of following the social distancing. They're tired of following the mask. They're tired of being away from their family. And the temptation of the holidays and Thanksgiving was too much. Um, uh, we've had slow increases in people bending the rules, which is understandable. I, I understand that people are tired, but when everyone does it all at once during a holiday, um, we get big numbers like we are seeing right now. Uh, unfortunately, Vermonters are starting to die again. Um, since the end of October, we've had 21 more deaths. Um, and unfortunately, I expect more of that um, being 11 days or so out from Thanksgiving. Um, hopefully, we will not see a similar response to Christmas and we will see how uh, people behave. Um, the state predicts a peak of uh, uh, perhaps 50 hospitalizations uh, at a maximum and around 10 ICU cases, and I agree with that assessment. Um, and uh, ultimately that is because this is not the same virus uh, that we experienced back in February and back in March. Uh, we know a lot more about this virus. We know a lot more about what to expect, what it does, how it behaves in populations, how it responds to things. We have medications now that we can use that are effective. Um, we know who to, hospital, who to hospitalize and who not to, uh, and we know uh, what to give them in terms of oxygen and when to ventilate them. Um, these are therapies that work. Um, uh, behavioral therapies are ultimately the safest. Masks, social distancing, and an aggressive state government. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, Atlantic, uh, just published an article on my home state of Iowa um, uh, commenting on this is what happens when government does nothing. Um, and it's very sad. Um, however, I am proud to state uh, that this is not Iowa and uh, I have an immense amount of respect um, for the management uh, of this uh, from our governor and our state. Um, and ultimately, if you look at the numbers, you can see that reflected. 
Um, uh, there have been 79 deaths uh, in Vermont thus far. Of those, 66 have been greater than age 70, which means essentially if you are under the age of 70 here in Vermont, there have been over 5,000 cases. Your risk of death from COVID is 0.3%. If you are above age 70, it is 1.3%. These are much, much better numbers than we were seeing in Vermont uh, just back in uh, uh, even July. Um, so we're doing relatively well despite the surge. Uh, and to boost that, uh, a vaccine is near. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is the first one coming down the pipe. Um, we actually expect the uh, federal government to, uh, uh, what happened is Pfizer applied for something called an emergency authorization use for this. Um, and uh, we expect approval uh, around the 14th. This has already been approved in the UK, um, conveniently enough, and uh, we've had a chance to glance at what you might call the package insert for it. In addition to all the data that uh, Pfizer has released. The Moderna vaccine is close behind, um, uh, probably about a week to 10 days. And then there are two more coming from AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson in the next six to 10 weeks. Um, these vaccines have proven incredibly effective thus far in the clinical trials. Uh, and uh, uh, just between uh, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, we have over 70,000 people uh, that have had these vaccines thus, thus far, uh, and they're reporting efficacy rates uh, in the high 90s as far as how well this works. Now, that is a short duration in which that efficacy is measured because these vaccines are new. We haven't had them for six months, so we only know they work really well uh, at about a month out, but that's encouraging. Presumably, uh, that efficacy will wane over time, but I, I don't have more data on that because we haven't had more time. Um, they're very low risk. Um, the uh, problems that we have seen with these vaccines are these standard problems you see with all vaccines. People get body aches and headaches and low grade fevers and it hurts at the site of infection. Uh, and that is not terribly surprising. Um, the, uh, uh, the way that uh, um, these two new vaccines are designed is very unique, but the materials and the preservatives and such that they're using are not new. Uh, these first two vaccines coming down the pipe are what are called mRNA uh, vaccines, and uh, that's messenger RNA, and it goes into your body, and your body makes part of the virus, and you develop your own response to it. It's not the whole virus. Uh, and uh, um, what's particularly clever about this is this is exactly what viruses do to all of us. They get in your system, and they inject their DNA or RNA, depending on what kind of virus they are. Um, and so basically, uh, Pfizer and Moderna hijacked the vaccine's own mechanism uh, to use against it. Um, uh, it's particularly brilliant. I don't know why we did it before, didn't do it before, but it may simply be that we did not have the technology. Um, it's still newer technology to get that mRNA to be stabilized. And unfortunately with the Pfizer vaccine, that means we have to store it uh, at uh, almost negative 90 degrees Fahrenheit or it falls apart and doesn't work. So it's a little bit onerous uh, logistically to get done, um, uh, but it is very doable. Um, we expect uh, a little under 6,000 doses uh, the first week of distribution in Vermont, and then we expect similar numbers uh, the weeks after that for a couple of weeks, and, and shortly after that, I expect uh, uh, Moderna will be coming. So on a relative basis, there will be a little bit of a scarcity of this vaccine uh, in the first few weeks, but I don't expect the ultimate impact to make any difference to most of us, if at all. Um, uh, getting the vaccine in the first round uh, is not going to mean you get to stop wearing a mask. It is not going to mean you get to start traveling, um, uh, given that we've all been living through COVID for nine, 10 months now. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, a couple of weeks difference is not going to make uh, much difference in our lives. We're going to have to keep doing the same things for a little bit yet. Um, I do not believe that we're going to have to wait for herd immunity before things lessen. Um, herd immunity is predicted at about 70% of the population getting uh, vaccinated. 
But if we can get people over the age 65 vaccinated and protect the vulnerable amongst us, uh, we can relax because as the numbers show, uh, for those less than 70, um, this is uh, not particularly scary as far as viruses go. Um, just as a, uh, a frame of reference, your lifetime risk of dying in an auto accident is one in 106. Um, so you should think about that every time you get in the car if you're terrified about COVID. Um, so what does this mean for schools and where are we at right now with schools? I'll go back to the fact that the behavioral stuff is incredibly effective. Um, masks work, social distancing work, uh, and we know that, and we know that, that when that's implemented in schools well, um, things go well. Um, there was a Brown study uh, that was released in October that looked at 200,000 kids in 47 states. Um, ultimately, what they showed is that even in areas of high COVID incidents, um, kids do not transmit COVID well. They can, uh, but they don't do it well. Um, the infection rate over those 200,000 kids was 0.13% and in the staff was 0.24%. When we get outbreaks in schools, it's coming from the community. It's not coming from within the schools. Don't understand why kids don't transmit it well, um, perhaps it, uh, uh, they're not as good at bringing things up as adults are, or perhaps the virus behaves differently, but they just don't move it as around, around as well as adults. So that's really, really encouraging. Schools are not super spreaders. Um, and then that falls though to the local community to manage this um, uh, and uh, impact their behavior um, as far as spread in the community. Um, and overall, I think you see that reflected in Vermont. Vermont as a whole has done quite well with this. Um, that's all I had as far as uh, prepared uh, uh, comments. Um, and I, I don't know how you want to handle this, Laura, but I would be happy to answer questions for however long you have set aside. Okay, great. First off, I want to invite any uh, OSSD board members with a question to pose to Josh. Uh, go ahead. Surely I was not that thorough. All right, hearing none from board members, although feel free if you were meaning to ask a question to jump in. Um, someone from the public um, may pose Josh a question if you have one. I will add, incidentally, that if uh, uh, if people want to reach me at the hospital for questions, I'm available as well. Your time is not truly limited to tonight. Could you provide our community? I'm How sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry, can you give out some uh, advice to how COVID is currently within our community? not just statewide, but just our community? So I can, I, can, uh, I can describe the spread of COVID in our community vaguely. Um, uh, it can't provide much in the way of specifics uh, secondary to uh, regulations on uh, people's individual health status. Um, what I can say is that it is in Randolph. Um, you're probably aware there have been cases within the school system there have been cases within local businesses. Uh, there have been cases uh, at the hospital, both in patients and staff. Um, it is moving uh, amongst the community. Um, thus far, um, what, ha what is happening is uh, Gifford uh, is able to respond to local cases in general much more quickly than the state because obviously um, the area that we are dealing with is much smaller. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we'll start to gather information, do contact tracing, start to isolate people. Um, the Department of Health will get involved. We will share information uh, and they will get on top of it as well. Um, to date, um, the Department of Health has done an exceptional job of this and we have managed to contain uh, these outbreaks, um, but uh, it's still here. Um, and uh, we are still getting positives uh, on a uh, weekly basis.
Kevin O'Donnell, O'Connell, did you have a question for Dr. White? Uh, sure. I was just curious as to what the uh, sensitivity to people who have uh, a, uh, immune deficiency or uh, severe asthmatic to it. Um, their sensitivity to catching it as opposed to just breaking down the, the rate by age. So your sensitivity to catching it, as far as uh, we can tell, uh, doesn't change much based on your vulnerabilities. Um, the, uh, um, so if you have asthma or uh, emphysema or an immune deficiency, you're not more likely to get COVID. But the concern is you are quite a bit more likely to have a more severe course of illness or even die. Um, uh, there are fairly clear um, uh, factors that uh, predispose people to a, a worse course of illness. Um, and an easy way to think about that is that uh, um, if uh, you're asked to carry a load, uh, but you are already carrying uh, a number of illnesses um, the likelihood that you'll be able to manage that well is less so. Um, so um, particularly important for those of us that are sicker or more vulnerable, um, avoid catching this in the first place. Although again, um, we are quite a bit more effective at managing it if you do. Thank you. Can I ask a question, Laura? This is Chris Armstrong. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, um, so I just wanted to ask um, about the CDC guidelines dropping to 10 days um, versus the 14 days. And you know, I'd read an article that it was more about trying to get people to comply rather than the time frame really being um, the best recommendation that 14 days is still the best, but they were dropping it to 10, hoping to get more people to comply because two weeks is such a long time for quarantine and things. Is that something that you've looked into or that maybe you could talk about? Uh, that is minimally true. Um, there is still some risk uh, after 10 days, um, but it is quite small. And uh, what the CDC was doing is they're looking at the uh, effect uh, of these recommendations, the impact on people and uh, um, the, uh, the benefit that is gained. Uh, for those of you that have a business mindset, you might have think of it as return on investment. And the return on investment on days 11 through 14 is uh, effectively zero, um, particularly that uh, given that most people uh, uh, don't tend to uh, comply. Um, it'd be a little bit like if we had an antibiotic um, uh, that was incredibly effective, but nobody was willing to take it secondary to the side effects. Um, ultimately, at 10 days, uh, 99 plus percent of people are not significant transmitters. Um, I would also like to point out, we've seen this pop up in the community, um, the PCR test uh, that we use at Gifford, and I'm only referring to this test because there are other tests out there, but the baseline gold standard test used at Gifford, uh, at UVM, um, and at most hospitals, um, detects the presence of viral particles. Um, that sticks around for up to 90 days in a person. It does not mean you are still sick with COVID, that does not mean you can still transmit it. A positive PCR test is not the same as being sick. And so the recommendations are that you test positive, we go back and we look at the first day that you had symptoms, and when you became free of your fever and your symptoms, we march out 10 days and we call it good there. Repeat testing is not helpful. Um, I only bring that up because that's come up in the community several times in the, uh, in the recent past. Um, you don't need to uh, keep getting tested until you're negative. It doesn't, it doesn't make anybody safer and it just wastes pre precious resources. Laura, could I ask a question? This is Hannah Arias. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Hannah. Um, Dr. White, do you think that we're far enough out from the Thanksgiving break um, to have a solid uh, understanding of what may have come from it? if there's a surge from our Thanksgiving break? I mean, it ended on what Sunday The help me out here, anyone? Um, how many days has it been? I'm looking at my calendar, it's on the wrong month. Yeah, yeah, I've been watching that too. I know exactly what you're talking about. 
Thanks. Uh, and the answer is uh, uh, right now we are in the middle of it. Um, and uh, um, I don't know if it's going to keep climbing or if it's going to start dropping. Um, and that is because we don't know exactly when people started to gather. We do know that a lot of people had family come in from town and they had them come in quite a bit early so that they could quarantine and isolate. So when were transmissions starting to occur? Was it mostly on Thanksgiving day or was it mostly a couple days before that? And the answer is at this point in time, I don't know. Um, uh, the 11th would be the day that would be two weeks after Thanksgiving. So we're getting close to having something fairly definitive, um, uh, but I can say we're we're in the midst of that surge. I just had one other question in regards to the the vaccine um, conversation, and that was just so you had mentioned that we're we're hoping to get enough so that we can protect the most vulnerable. But is the the, the vac it's my understanding that a vaccine is being tested on the healthy population at this point, and it, is it going to be approved even if it is for the you know the emergency use emergency use um, would it be approved for elderly and for people with pre-existing conditions or would that um, would they not be the first to get it until um, phase trials have actually tested it in those populations? So I can only comment on the Pfizer data because that's the only one I've seen closely. Um, uh, but it was tested across age ranges and demographics from 16 on up. Um, and the Pfizer vaccine uh, showed equal efficacy in all age ranges. Um, and uh, um, I would presume Moderna is the same, uh, but that is an assumption on my part. I have not seen that data um, such that uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll wait until they release uh, their information, which typically comes when they get their authorization. So I expect that fairly soon. Um, but it was tested across the uh, the ages. And in the short term, we'll focus on the vulnerable. But in the long term, um, I expect it's not going to be too long before it's available to anybody uh, that is interested in the vaccine. Shannon Hans, do you have a question? Uh, yes, hi. Um, you were talking about how um, you're seeing about one case a week at Gifford. Um, more than that right now. I'm sorry? More than that right now, sometimes quite a bit more. Okay. Um, are, are these people generally recovering? Um, what, what age group? What procedures are being used? I'm just curious. Um, it's we don't see very many in young people, as is consistent with the uh, uh, population uh, demographics. It tends to be adults, and then it tends to be uh, spread across the uh, age ranges. Um, uh, our uh, data has been consistent with that seen elsewhere. Um, by and large, uh, people are tolerating it well, and the vast majority uh, do not require any kind of hospitalization or significant interventions. Okay. Um, what what kind of procedures are being used at Gifford Hospital? Uh, it it kind of depends on how specific your question is, because that would potentially take me hours uh, to. <laughs> okay. Did you, have a, did you have a narrow focus on that? Um, I guess what I hear in the news is um, ventilators um, are often needed. Um, steroids. Um, do people have to be transferred to other hospitals? <clears throat> um, but, you know, maybe there's just a variety of situations. So ventilators are actually fairly rarely required. Um, the, uh, um, let's see if I wrote it down. Um, I believe there were, yeah, so there were 120 new cases on the 5th. Uh, and I believe that four of them were in the ICU. So of those 120, um, uh, it would be 4% or less that required a uh, ventilator. Um, steroids are fairly commonly used uh, for anybody that requires oxygen, which can be delivered at home, depending on how well a person is doing and what kind of resources they have. 
um, mm -hmm. uh, and steroids are, are something that will pull the trigger on fairly quickly because uh, um, it's low risk, cheap, and a well understood medication. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, you're feeling at this point at Gifford, you have the resources that you need to take care of people that are coming in. Yes, I don't expect that this is going to overwhelm the healthcare system uh, in Vermont. Um, uh, our, uh, our populace um, uh, and our state government has been much more responsive uh, to this uh, than other states. Um, and uh, I don't think we're going to experience anywhere near what's happening uh, say, for instance, some states in the Midwest. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I see a couple other people have questions, and then we're going to move on to um, to Lane Millington's report. So, Evan no, Brown, no, do you still you have a... In the chat, there's some questions. Sorry. Yeah, okay. and I don't know if we're going to be able to handle them all. Um, we're just not going to have time. Um, Evan Brown, do you have a, a, a question? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, so my question was, how do you um, how do you deal with someone who might um, contract symptoms or contract the virus again? And maybe so, for example, let's say that they get tested, comes back positive, they have the symptoms and then they recover, okay? And obviously there's that 90 day, um, that 90 day period where they can still test positive. Um, so my question is, can someone, um, can someone, um, I guess you could sort of say, contract it again by um, sort of getting the symptoms back um, even though like after they lost the symptoms or after they went away? Sure. So the answer to that is clearly yes, you can get COVID again. Um, that, th that simple fact was not terribly surprising. There are almost no infectious illnesses that uh, people have perfect immunity for um, over time. Um, uh, so uh, the easy example for that is the common cold. Um, you know, there are lots of people that get more than one cold in, in a given winter. Um, uh, uh, and there are some uh, diseases that are pretty rare to get again, but none of them are perfect. Um, unfortunately, we are still early enough in this pandemic that we don't have a good sense of, uh, is that normal to be able to get it again? Or is that the exception to the rule? Um, so I don't know what the average person's immunity is. Um, and on the same token, I don't know um, what kind of uh, uh, immunity the vaccine is going to provide over long term. I don't know if this is going to be a yearly thing like influenza or a one shot deal with a booster. Um, all of that remains to be seen. Sorry, I know a lot of this is not satisfying. <laughs> All right, um, Kate Kennedy, do you have a question? I do. Uh, if uh, Thank you for doing this. And if and when we go back to school, uh, what is your recommendation for lunches in the school? Uh, kids in the classrooms, six feet apart, keeping the volume down because if they're eating and talking, just what are your recommendations for if and when, how do we handle lunchtime? Thank you. Uh, that would be different from school to school. Um, uh, yes, to the social distancing and the uh, spreading people out, um, particularly given that these are going to be times when people don't have masks on. Um, and so one school may require, uh, you know, um, doing pods or having uh, meals and shifts. Um, another school may not have that problem, given that some of our schools are pretty small and classroom sizes are quite small. Uh, some schools are, are having lunch in their classrooms uh, and they don't go to a lunchroom. They remain at their desks. Um, my, my son is, is back to school four days a week and my daughter is only two days a week because the size of the school cannot accommodate social dis distancing based on the number of pupils they have. Um, so that is going to be a, a different answer depending on the structure 
uh, of the school and the number of pupils at a given school. Right, I was, I was thinking of Randolph, uh, at least the middle and high school where they're in classrooms and they're staying in their classrooms, but um, I don't know if they're all able to maintain six feet. Maybe they are, but just the idea of them, you know how middle schoolers get and high schoolers yeah, get. Um, it'll be so exciting to be together again. Are they getting, I know I'm worried about the teachers having to really play cop here and say, settle down everybody. When you talk, you're spreading your potato chips and your germs. Sure, sure. Um, fortunately, we are able to rely on the fact that kids are not good spreaders of this. I think I think your concern is reasonable. Um, I am not uh, well versed in the the layout of the Randolph School, so I apologize. I can't comment intelligently on the spread of any any given classroom. Um, uh, so I, I'm sorry, I can't be more useful there. No, thank you very much. All right, um, we only have time for a couple more questions. Um, Lee Provost, does it have, uh, do you have a, still have a question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering what your professional recommendation for students returning to Randolph Middle and High School would be, considering that in Lane's previous emails, 30, 30 to 40% of our community members weren't going to change their behaviors in terms of wearing masks and um, hand washing and social distancing and all of those recommendations? Uh, I would have to see all the information before I made a recommendation. Um, I find that uh, comment incredibly concerning and, and rather disappointing um, and understand why the school board voted the way they did. Um, I do believe that uh, um, children are better served back in school, but as I mentioned, um, the, the bulk of the control of this virus is going to occur in the community, and if the community says we're not going to do it, um, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Um, and I guess uh, um, ultimately I'm grateful I'm not on the school board. So, sorry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time and your presentation and your patient question answering. I really appreciate it. We all do, obviously. And um, yeah, thank you and have a good evening. Certainly. And uh, um, in closing, uh, um, like I said, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out with questions. Uh, Ashley Lincoln uh, has my contact information. Um, uh, it is a significant part of my job and our job at the hospital to interact with the community and answer your questions. This is what I get paid for. Um, reach out. Um, we're more than happy uh, to try to get to each of you, depending on what you want to know. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, Lane. We would love to hear from you uh, what the cabinet and administration are thinking and planning for the next weeks ahead. Um, thank you. Yeah, uh, hopefully folks can hear me. Um, actually, it's good to see quite a, quite the turnout we got. I think we got a record at 209 right now. Um, so it's, uh, it's good to see so many faces. Um, a couple of things kind of before I, I go into the presentation piece, um, the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, on the question about, you know, eating in the cafeteria, um, we do have a very extensive COVID-19 handbook that was developed that have all those procedures and protocols in it. I know it's a very, very dry read and um, those protocols have been adapted to the specific context of each school. Um, but it is worth um, the community knowing that it is up on the website. So if you've got questions, um, don't be afraid to hit that, that handbook um, or to ask the questions of, of administration um, within the district. Um, in terms of the, the 30%, 30 to 40% that weren't following the protocols, um, that was really in reference to um, travel and social gatherings. So that was the big concern at the time, um, just for clarification when those comments were made, um, is that you know when we were calling up uh, during this last round and talking with folks, finding out that they had traveled or finding out that they had been a part of a large social gathering, um, trying to convince them to quarantine was exceptionally difficult and there was a considerable amount of pushback. Um, so I think the, the mask piece I can't really comment so much on. I've actually seen pretty good mask, mask wearing, uh, but it, it was the travel and the social distancing. So 
if uh, people will give me a little little leeway um, to kind of talk maybe for four or five minutes here before we kind of get into the questions. Um, I think the real goal for tonight is to kind of really examine where we are following the transition to remote learning and then moving into a recommendation for a path forward that the board can contemplate um, as part of the decision-making process that it undergoes. Um, in terms of the remote learning, we moved into this modality because at the time we had a large number of positive cases that came from local gatherings and they affected every school in the district. Uh, but most importantly, above all that, we didn't have enough information to know um, who should be in quarantine and not in our buildings, right? And that's a little bit disturbing when you don't know who you should be keeping out um, and having that, those kind of communications with. Um, and part of the reason for that was because of how widespread the social gatherings were. Um, during the time of closure, we also had a number of other reported cases that came in, um, but these were from different sources, um, but they still would have impacted our, our schools. So I am very satisfied um, in the effect and the decision um, to go remote for the time that we did. At the time, we made the decision really to allow for time, um, time for the virus to clear our halls, uh, time for folks to reflect on the safety guidance and for those that were not following it, it to hopefully kind of change their behaviors and um, a time to get a real clear picture of who should be in quarantine so that we could make sure that that was happening before we brought folks back. Um, so we get down to what, what are my current recommendations? Um, I had pulled these together um, with some consultation um, and have adapted them a little bit after um, talking with the cabinet uh, a few times. Um, and the cabinet is not 100% behind this. Um, it's kind of mixed across the cabinet. Um, it's real easy to see kind of both sides uh, of, of what they're discussing. But my recommendation right now is that we return to the hybrid modality on December 14th. Okay, so that's step one. And then that we begin a phased return to full in-person instruction, starting with the youngest grades first on January 18th. I recommend that this phased return continues until all grades through at least grade eight are back in session, um, hopefully by early February, all right? And there's some good rationale for this. Um, current conditions right now, at least in Orange County, are actually pretty good. Um, we're fairly stable. We typically get three cases a day across all of Orange County. We've had a couple of cases in the last week or two where it's been up to nine. Um, but we've had no new cases reported to us um, from the Department of Health that would impact the school in the last week. Um, secondly, the timing of the phased return to full in-person instruction was designed uh, to increase the number of students at school as cases should be decreasing statewide, right? We've got all these um, new factors that are coming into play, you know, potential vaccines. Hopefully people are paying a little bit more attention to what they need to do in terms of travel, in terms of social gatherings, and as well as the fact that we're getting through the winter months, the worst months of uh, the coronavirus. And so when we start this full in-person um, shift, this phasing in, it starts off with, with the youngest students first, who folks will say are the least at risk, um, and then slowly working up through the grades. And again, as the enrollments are going up, it's because hopefully the cases uh, in and around us in the state are going down, right? It was plotted out and planned out this way. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that with this consideration, we will have additional mitigation strategies in place right? You want to add some protective factors to balance out some of the new risk factors that you might be introducing into the system. And so kind of in preparation for this, there's a couple of things that, that we've got to increase our efforts on. Um, and the first is keeping the virus out of the schools, right? First step is keep it out. And the second step is if you can't keep it out is uh, minimizing the spread if it actually shows up here. Faculty and community members, we're going to have to do some strong communication around this will need to self-report to the district if they have the coronavirus. That's going to be a strong need. We do get information from the Department of Health and they are working overtime, but we often hear three or four days um, before we hear from the Department of Health from the individuals themselves that yes, they've tested positive for coronavirus, so we know to do our, our tracing. Um, so because of that lag time, 
if we do this, it's going to be critical that everybody in this community is step into the plate. Um, if they find out they're positive um, for the coronavirus, it's to call up our school nurses who will keep things confidential um, so that they can do their tracing and so that we can keep the people out of the district for the quarantine period to keep everyone else safe. Folks will also need to be very honest about quarantining and following through when it's necessary. If you take off for a weekend to a place that you shouldn't go and you brought the kids with you, the expectation is you're gonna be honest about that and do what you need to do, which is stay home through the quarantine period. If we can get the community members to step up and really do those two pieces, we'll be in really, really good shape as we go through this process that I'm recommending. The last piece, um, and this is the one that's more difficult and it's one that folks balked at across the state, especially the superintendents, um, but I'm willing um, to step into this breach uh, if folks aren't going to push back too hard about it, um, because it does step on a little bit of uh, confidentiality about what people do in their own homes. But the district is going to need to be very forceful when it comes to students and faculty who may have violated the safety guidance. This means that if we reasonably suspect a violation, those folks are going to be told to stay out of our schools until the quarantine period has passed, right? We get reports all the time. Um, we see it on Facebook that folks are traveling over the weekend. The parents will show up with the kids on Monday morning. We'll question them about it. They'll be less than honest to our faces, and we have to ask them, nope, you got to go home. You got to quarantine. Don't want to be in that position. It's easier if people do this themselves, but we will take a very forceful stance on this. Um, again, these are parts of the, the efforts to really keep the virus out of the schools to begin with. If the virus makes it into our schools, um, you know, we're actually in pretty good shape to handle that. You can't keep the virus out, but schools are really good about reducing transmission if it comes in. There are misconceptions around the state that transmission does not happen in the schools. That is false. I sit down and I meet with 12 other superintendents on a weekly basis. A third of them report transmission within their schools. Our first case, four of the five got it from transmission within the schools. So it does happen in the schools, but we're very good at mitigating it, keeping it from spreading um, any further than it needs to. And really all that means is that we've just got to reinvest ourselves and vigorously um, and strictly follow the safety protocols during school hours. And everyone's got to support this. It's got to become part of our culture. And in good cultures, what people do is if people aren't living up to the norms and the mores and the expectations, right, the other people there will call them on it um, and make sure that everybody's behaving as they should. The other piece in terms of minimizing the spread um, is that facilities has taken very good advantage of this time that we've had in remote session. We've been able to get the contractors in to do $170,000 worth of um, enhanced work on our ventilation systems. Right now, all the nurses' offices are set up with separate ventilation systems and operate under negative pressure, right? Just the way they're supposed to. Negative pressure means the air gets sucked in from the rest of the building as opposed to having an infected individual in the nurse's office and having the air blown out into the rest of the building. Randolph Elementary, Randolph Union High School, and Randolph Technical Center all have in place right now, up and operating, full ultraviolet light sterilization systems um, to help kill um, any of the virus that may be on the aerosolized particles that get sucked up through our HVAC system. RUHS and RTCC right now are in the process of having all their exhaust fans replaced with more efficient and powerful models. They had the oldest fans in the system, and there was some concern that when we brought in the enhanced filtration, right, it puts more of a load on the motors. We were afraid the motors were going to start burning out. So they have all been replaced with more efficient models and ones that are going to move more air through those buildings. Braintree and Brookfield are actually in pretty good shape. Their HVAC, HVAC systems are in good shape. They didn't support the uh, ability to put UV in up there. Otherwise, we would have. Um, but they also have bigger classroom spaces. And in lots of, lots of those classes, fewer kids. 
um, than RES and Randolph. So that was some of the reasons for those decisions. Um, the last piece is that we did, we actually had tents made so that come springtime, we can set them up at each of the schools so that a lot of the school's activities um, can happen outside. So my recommendations um, are there, right? December 14th, return to hybrid. Um, as we move along um, towards uh, January 18th, you know, the recommendation is to start to phase in, you know, K to three, uh, excuse me, K to two would be the first back at that point in time. Give it a couple of weeks and bring in the next couple of grades. Um, you guys have a written copy of that recommendation. I'll make it public if the board approves it. A um, couple of other things, though, um, because I do know that there are some nervousness with the staff, and, and I, I've got to say that their anxiety is justified. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And then I'll, I'll shut up and let people ask questions for a little bit. Um, one of the things that people um, should know um, is that the state has really treated the schools very differently from how it's treated other agencies. They've applied a double standard to the schools. And I can give you a couple of examples which make people anxious. The state closed all athletic activities as they were deemed too unsafe but they did not shut down school athletics. It took weeks of pushback on this double standard um, before they finally chose to close school athletics. Despite moving to increased restrictions on social gatherings and travel, as well as declaring that all state workers should be working from home, no such order or restrictions were placed on schools. In fact, we currently remain in step three the least restrictive step under which we are expected to operate. When asked why, the answer was not because it's better for learning or because it's safer. It was because, and I quote, society will shut down if the schools are not open. Again, this double standard leaves people with feelings of mistrust. We've heard very good news about coming vaccines, but despite the fact that schools are expected to be open, and despite the fact that by our very nature as a congregate setting, we violate the most basic tenet of safety when it comes to COVID, and that's social distancing. Despite all this, school faculty are not on the list of those receiving the vaccine before the general public. We've been told, and I've talked about this already, that the virus has not spread in schools. A third of the 12 superintendents I work with say it has in their buildings. And as I expressed, it's happened in our own um, during the first cases that we had. It probably happened during the second round of cases that we had, but those folks had so much exposure outside of as well, it's hard to tell. So we couldn't say definitively. Um, but for these reasons and more, I really feel that the faculty does have a right to feel anxious um, about you know, our contemplations and that those anxieties do need to be taken into consideration. Uh, I did set these recommendations up in that whole plan that runs out through um, probably mid-March. I did set it up to minimize risk, to take into account those anxieties and to make sure that we were increasing enrollments while the risks, at least the projected risks outside um, of our school community should be on the dec decrease. So I'll stop for a while with that in case there's questions from anyone. Okay, thanks, Lane. Um, so I'm gonna open up for questions first, board members, um, and then afterwards to everyone else. Uh, if everyone would please state their name before they uh, have a comment or question, that would be really helpful just so everyone's clear on who's speaking. All right, any uh, board member questions first? Hi, Ann Kaplan, Ann. board member. Oh, go ahead, oh, Megan. Sorry, go ahead, Ann. Uh, Ann Kaplan, board member. I'm just curious, um, Lane, when I read through, it, you did have a little bit of a, a safety buffer in your plans, just saying if numbers were going up and, and you felt like it was not safe that you would pull back on on your phases. Can you explain those a little bit more so the public knows what what those would look like? Yeah, so basically, um, 
you know, the, the, the biggest thing, and I think the CDC said it the best, if I can get their words correct, is that how successful schools are going to be in, in reopening and staying open is really dependent upon what's happening in the communities around them. And so the way that this phased in approach was created, there's three or four steps to it, right? You bring in a couple of grades, you wait a couple of weeks, you bring in a couple of grades. Oh, we've got a vacation. We should probably wait until a week or two after vacation in case cases increase before we bring in the next round of, of students. But the overarching piece of this is in each case, it's if conditions permit. We can always put a pause on bringing in the next step, the next phase, if conditions have, have gone south and wait until they improve um, before you know, we implement the next phase. Yep, there's a timeline with expected dates. Obviously, that's if everything goes swimmingly well. It may, we'll keep our fingers crossed, it may not. So we do need that flexibility to be able to push things off a little bit if the conditions um, don't support it that are happening in and around the community. It's a good question. <clears throat> Hi, it's Megan Salt here from the board. Um, the last couple of meetings we've talked about uh, consistency for the students and also the teachers. So your um, plan is to return to hybrid on 12-14. That would have three days back in person for each group. Um, is this really consistent for the students to come back for three days before vacation? Um, and it, is it also consistent for teachers who may or may not return to work and then have substitutes in the classroom? What's your take on that? So the idea, um, and I think the thing, and some of the teachers are, are welcome to, to join in. Um, the biggest concern that we got was how quickly the change to remote occurred, right? Because it was usually people would party on the weekends. It takes five to six days for the, the symptoms to show up for them to test positive. So the next weekend and Sunday afternoon, we'd be finding out, oh, crap, you know, we've got some cases. We're just learning about it at five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. We don't have time to do contact tracing um, and know who we need to keep out of the schools. And so we need to switch to remote session. And that is disruptive. Um, the goal for the hybrid is to get us back in hybrid. And once we go back to hybrid, I don't plan on switching back. Um, we will manage the situations as they arise. If it's a pod of kids that are affected, if it's a classroom, um, and as long as the state uh, Department of Health is in um, conjunction with what we're saying, is supporting what we're saying, those are the ones that will go out, but the rest will remain and continue on to keep it in hybrid, to keep that, that switching back and forth from happening. Um, one of the reasons, there's actually two reasons why I'm suggesting December 14th to switch back to the hybrid. One is because we won't have the staff um, available to do that because a number of them have kind of called up when I said, well, we might be going back on the 9th and said, well, we kind of did what we weren't supposed to, we need to quarantine. Um, so it won't be until the 14th until we have the staff back to be able to safely operate. Um, but the second reason for choosing the 14th, which is a good one, is if you guys make a decision tonight, they've got a full week to plan for that transition back, as opposed to, you know, tomorrow or the next day we're coming back into hybrid. And that is to take into account the, the, the genuine piece there that there is a lot of prep in this transitioning back and forth that needs to go on and people need time um, to plan for that. Laura, I, I have a comment slash question, if I could. This is Hannah Arias from the board. Um, my understanding was that when we took that vote on the Thursday before Thanksgiving break, we agreed that we would reevaluate if conditions warranted, we would then decide to go back into hybrid. I, I'm not seeing, and I'm, open to hearing i you know i'm 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 pulled in a lot of different directions so i'm not trying to bring anyone to my side or anything i i just don't see the evidence of conditions having changed so much that it would warrant us reevaluating at this point we don't know what may have been the effect of what has happened over thanksgiving if we vote on something tonight and as Dr. White stated, we probably don't have a full understanding of data until at least Friday. I, I'm just not seeing um, 
enough evidence for me to be convinced that we should be taking a vote tonight um, because the vote, as I understood it, was to um, reevaluate when conditions change. Conditions have not changed. If they've changed at all, they've gotten worse. I'm, I'm Hannah. Heidi's my wife. Someone just, okay, can I just Just because I do have the data for Orange County sitting in front of me going all the way back to 1114. Um, at the time that we, we closed, that very day, we had 23 cases in Orange County alone. Um, leading up to that, we had 15, 16, 7, 7, and then 23. Um, remember that people gathered for Thanksgiving Thursday or probably a little bit before, so we, we've probably been seeing the spike, right? It started to rise in the state um, not too long ago. Um, Friday, it was sitting, well, it was sitting at 67, 67. Um, then Wednesday last week, it was 101, 178. 127, 120. So it looks like, at least across the state, we've got this spike that has just happened, presumably from Thanksgiving, the holiday. In Orange County, however, our local context, um, since we had the week out, um, what are we looking at for cases? We've had 11533931113. So it looks like while we're not at zero, that's a pretty consistent little trend um, of low numbers. And again, that's Orange County as a total. That's not just our three towns. So to me, again, this is just what we know. That's pretty darn good data. That's kind of what it was before we, we went into went into remote. I got to say that's, that's it, it, not to, I, I'm not trying to be combative here, but that's not enough of a trend for me to think that three days before being away for then a, a, a break is is worth the risk to me. No, and I'm not I'm not trying to argue you out of it. I'm just there is data I'm just throwing it out there. People can interpret it the way they will. <clears throat> and again we also have had no cases reported in the last week that are directly related to the school. You know, so we've been clear for a week on the school side of things. Um, the other thing, you know, since we're kind of on the discussion, I don't want to eat into people's question times, though, is that we did learn one important thing during this time of remote session. And what we learned is it actually gave people license to go out and behave poorly. Because on the parent side of things, um, they knew that if they went off and they traveled because school wasn't in session, they had time to quarantine and it wouldn't affect their kids' ability to go to school because we weren't in session. For the first time, um, we had faculty as well in a, in a good number. Um, and again, not being critical, just stating the facts as they are, that's the first time I've ever had a concern about the faculty. And it seemed to be because we were in remote session, and some even said that, oh, I thought we were going to be out until after January. I thought I had time to quarantine. And so in a smaller sense, this choice to go to remote session, you know, I'm not going to blame it on us going to remote session, but it seemed to give people license to behave a little bit more poorly than they, they normally would have. Um, Which... I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, Hannah, go ahead. If you want to finish your statement, go ahead. Thank you, Ashley. I just I, I, I just have to then go back to a comment I made in that last meeting when we took the vote, which is this is about responsibility. People are not taking responsibility and it is infuriating. There is a, a comment in the text that there are kids doing nothing during remote learning. I, who, <laughs> I don't understand where that, um, that, that I hope that that person in public comment can talk a little bit uh, uh, more about that. Um, uh, who, who, who is taking responsibility for those kids not doing anything during remote learning? And that certainly is not on the teachers because they are working their behinds off. So responsibility. Um, thank you, Laura. Can I have a moment to speak? Yes, of course. Okay, this is Ashley Lincoln. I'm on the board. Um, so I certainly appreciate all the comments we've heard this evening. Um, I do have the 
um, you know, the, the ability to work with Dr. Josh White every day, and I appreciate his approach to COVID and his guidance on behavior. Um, I think we would all be remiss if we felt like we were ever, or in the near future, going to hit zero cases. Um, right now, that is not the case with any pandemic. Um, you are still going to have lingering numbers of positive cases. It really comes down to how that is managed and how the rest of the people who are not infected behave. Um, I'm really sorry to hear Lane share that going into remote session was basically a ticket to travel or a ticket to um, gather in large groups when even our governor has requested that all Vermonters behave differently. Um, I think it's safe to say that many of us have modified the way we behave. And I'm sorry that that's not happening um, here within this discussion as well. Um, to wait for zero, we'll be waiting forever. I believe strongly that our kids need to be back in school. Um, I have been contacted by many parents. I have been contacted by many taxpayers who are questioning the approach that is being used. And um, maybe that's not going to happen tomorrow, but I do believe that our children are better served in a classroom with their peers. Um, part of learning is not just the academic book, book work, but it is social interactions, learning how to get along um, and growing as a person. And I worry that our children are not getting that experience sitting in front of a computer screen at home during the day. So I do believe strongly that we have taken every precaution necessary. And I credit our um, fantastic facilities team for working diligently with contractors to modify the air handling systems to implement what has to be done um, so our kids can go back to that building and so can our teachers. Mask wearing will remain, washing hands will remain, and behaving outside of work should be an expectation for everybody. Thank you. Any other further comments from board members before I open it up to the general public? Uh, Lane, again, looking at you, you've got to staff the schools. Um, do you have a sense that with this plan that you have in place, you're going to have the staff, enough staff willing to come in to work? The, the answer that, to that question could change on any given day. Um, I want to put the caveat in there that the majority of parents, the majority of the faculty have done a damn good job doing what they're supposed to. Um, so I don't want that to be lost, you know, when we focus on, on, on the outliers a little bit. And, and I'm very respect, respectful for, for what they've done. Um, and hopefully we can get everybody on board on the same page. But um, I do believe our staff are professionals. Right? They're people that care deeply about kids. I believe that those um, that reasonably can be there to do the job that's before them will be there to do the job that's before them. As long as we're keeping things safe. And right now, like I said, at least in my estimation, the conditions um, are actually pretty good. Um, they're as good or better than, than they were before when we were in remote session. Um, We've had a lot of discussions with the community uh, about what needs to happen on their part. I think the remote session, if nothing else, hopefully also made some of them think that, hey, we got to pull this together because we don't want to be in remote session for the rest of the year, um, right? So I'm hoping there's been some time for reflection. Um, I genuinely believe in my heart we can do this. Um, but I also, uh, my kid attends the same school, um, right? He goes to RUHS. If um, things do not look safe, I will step to the plate to change things or to hold off on the next phase or to do what we need to do to make sure they're safe. I think we've proven that so far. Um, 
And so hopefully people have a little bit, bit of faith in, in, in that judgment. But again, staff are professionals, the ones who can be here, there are some with legitimate reasons that they can't, but the ones who will be here, I, I expect will be here. Any further questions from board members? Okay, hearing none, um, I'm gonna open up for public comment. Um, I do wanna remind people to please um, hold off after your first comment from speaking again until we get through um, others. We have still over 200 people here, so likely there are plenty of questions. Um, I'm also gonna try to respond to some of the raised hands that I see um, uh, over here on my comment. Um, so um, I'll, go back and forth between them. Um, Lisa Floyd, do you have a question that you wanna uh, start with? No, I'm sorry, Laura, I must've clicked on the wrong thing. I'd, I'll leave this open to community members and other people who wanna chime in. Thank you. Okay, um, Amy Ferris. Thanks, Laura. Um, I just have two things following up on Megan and Ann's questions. Um, what, with Ann's question, I have the same question. What happens if there's a building in the district that can't open because of staffing? Will enough? Will the rest of the building still open? Because um, I know there is probably going to be some issues. Um, so that was that's the first part. And then thinking about Megan's question, um, and I'm thinking about my own kids, a ninth grader and a twelfth grader, and the fourth graders that I teach. I merged my two groups um, for the remote learning. So each week they're getting everyday instruction. And if we go hybrid next Monday, as Megan stated, the elementary kids are gonna get three days. Um, and I just question if headed into the extended Christmas holiday, if that's really the best thing for them. And I fully recognize that you get more out of in-person instruction, but I just, I've been toying with that idea ever since I read Lane's email. Is it really, is it better to have six or seven days or is it better to have three days a piece for each group? Whereas for my high schoolers, I can totally see, they can almost switch on a day and it's instant support. And so I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there for people to think about. No, I didn't know if there was a question. Um, otherwise, the comments are just are appreciated. Okay, Megan Dunnigan. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Hi. Oh, Go hi. Ahead. Um, so will um, full remote still be an option for kids who are enrolled in that if you start to phase back to full in-person instruction? So full remote um, is an option right now. It will continue to be an option. Um, potentially will even entertain more um, for folks that have a necessity. Um, so in other words, if you know, going back to full in-person, if you know, your, your child or a student has a medical condition, that you know requires them to be a little bit more distant uh, out of the building um, just to protect them from severe consequences from COVID should they get it, then those will definitely still be considered um, for remote, fully remote uh, learning um, if that question is asked. So that, so that so you know what you were talking about or? Yeah, so would it be for if you do phase into more in person instruction, full remote would be reserved for children with uh, medical needs? Yeah, they have, or, they have, um, they have real necessity. Um, we'll allow them to add to the full remote. At some point in time, um, we will get to the point where the states of emergency at both the state and the national level are removed. At those point in times, it would be expected that everybody is coming back to full in person. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
So I'm skipping over people who, who had a chance to ask Dr. White a question. I'll come back to you. Um, but so Dave Amadon is next. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Am I there? Yeah. Yes, okay. you are. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to give a little more context. Um, I am very appreciative of all the work that everybody has done. I think that they've done the best job that they could be expected to do in the given circumstances. Um, I, when I look at numbers, I'm looking at our local numbers and I'm looking at what data is showing us from around the world. And based on that, I really do support in-person learning right now. I just wanted to speak to the comment of having an eighth grader who the last couple of weeks here has had a very low workload because he's doing his assignments as given. And, and this is, I, I want to clarify this. I, I, I am reporting what is told to me by a 13 year old. Okay. Now, granted it's my own son and I trust him in his veracity, but, but that is the perspective. So I want to be clear on that. And I also want to be clear that I don't think the teachers are doing anything. I don't think they're doing anything to create a problem. I don't think that there's necessarily a, a, a way that they could solve it. I think this comes back to family responsibilities, but basically the bottom line is my son saying, well, I have no work today because only five of us did the work and the teachers want to get everybody caught up. Or I'm really disappointed we didn't get to go onto this unit today because not enough people finished the last unit so we can't go on. So when I'm making comments and I'm, I'm really referring for the board members so they can clarify what I typed, that's what I'm referring to. I can't speak for every kid and I don't really know, you know, I, I know that my kids are doing their work. I feel like I'm in a very privileged position and that both my wife and I are able to be home with them even though we're doing our jobs at the same time. And I know not everybody has that, that privilege or that luxury. So I just wanted to speak to that. It's not a question. It's just a comment for the board that um, in my opinion, any day, any day that they are seeing each other and interacting socially is a benefit, is a positive. And I think, you know, we get so involved in academics, we really fool ourselves if we think that what our, we're teaching seventh and eighth graders is what happened 200 years ago or how to do a math problem. We're not, we're teaching them how to be people and we can only do that so well through a, through a screen. So. I'll cut myself off there. It's not really a question. It's just a comment. And I just want to have that opinion shared with the board and with the community. And, and again, my support for the administration and the teachers and staff who I think are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, next is Nora Skolnick. Hi there, thanks. Um, I, I am uh, speaking on behalf again um, in my role as president of the association. And um, we had sent a letter to um, the board earlier. We had asked our members um, what, what their opinion is of this. Um, should we be returning to um, hybrid before the Christmas break, um, after the Christmas break, um, and, and how that would affect them and for their feedback on it. And I want to point out that over 80%, I believe it was like 82 or 83% of our members um, spoke very strongly in, in wanting to keep um, it being fully remote through at least the Christmas break. Um, and for many of the reasons that I think Hannah spoke to, um, one is that conditions have not changed um, overall. The, the numbers are, are going up um, across the state. Um, students are reporting that their families did travel um, and, and that there is um, concern about that. And, and that, that lack of consistency, um, there was even an article I, I had read in the New York Times, the, the stresses on teachers and staff right now are, are huge. I mean, we talk about the stresses of children and, and yes, that should be foremost in, in our decisions um, that that's our job is to be helping and, and teaching students. Um, but there is the reality of the stress on staff as well. And the stress on staff right now is incredible. Um, and by switching before the Christmas break, it is adding a huge amount of stress to the majority of the staff. Um, and I believe unnecessarily, it, is it really worth that risk um, and the concerns to health risk, the increased stress, the increased workload, um, because many teachers, the reality is, is they've already switched how they are teaching units through 
to the vacation so that, that it can be done well remotely, um, that they spent most of their Thanksgiving um, break doing that, um, is that worth it for three days of in-person? Um, also with the, the, if not real perceived, um, definitely um, perceived risk um, involved in coming back early to being in person. Um, also wanted to point out that um, I think a lot of concern, rightly so, has been raised on, on the effect of children um, in, in terms of not having those social and emotional supports that they get and the skills that they learn through school. And I would be the first to say that it is not the same on a computer screen as it is if you are in person. And again, I'm speaking now from someone who is having to do it because of personal circumstances um, through a computer screen. That doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, that doesn't mean that that support can't be there. I think my class has shown that um, above and beyond what I ever would have expected this year. Um, for me personally, um, and in working together and supporting each other and helping each other um, to learn and to make it as successful as possible. But I also want to point out that a lot of the emotional and, and trauma uh, and, and the stresses on children is, is not just because of school. Um, it is because we are in a pandemic and, and there are stresses that are beyond our control and school is not going to solve all of that. We can have children be in school in person and those stresses and, and those, that toll, that trauma is still going to be there and to be dealt with, need to be dealt with. Um, it, it's, it's a pandemic. Um, families are out of work families are, are stressed, um, families are ill, have members that are ill. Um, families might have members that, that they can't be with each other, they can't be with their children or their grandchildren or their grandparents or aunts and uncles who they normally look to for support. All of those things are not within the um, purview of, of schools um, and nor can schools solve all of that. Um, we can certainly help, and I believe we can do that, whether we are in remote or hybrid or in, per in person um, fully. So um, I did want to speak to that as well. Um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Kathy Ingalls. Technology and me, I had to figure out how to unmute. Okay, I'm fully in support of the plan, but not the timeline for the 14th. I think it's too small a window and I'm excited to go like from hybrid and then start and finally get into full person. And I'm in the building right now working with some students and I know they're adjusting it's really no different than, I'll equate this to the two-year-old who falls down and you go, oh, you're okay, you're okay, and they'll get up. And then they're all smiles or the one, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, and they are in tears. I'm not trying to make this flip. I'm just saying how we respond to this is how they're responding. And the students that were in the building today working with me, and I'll have some the rest of this week, are coming in with positive attitudes and working and I have kids texting and emailing me to ask to set up Google Meets. They're taking this responsibility upon themselves and then we figure out how to do it. I right now am texting with two parents. So the best timeline is for after the break because there really aren't that many more days before that comes. And then we will have more information because lots of times Thanksgiving celebration goes all the way to Sunday afternoon. It isn't just Thursday. Um, and I am, you know, a community member. My kids graduated from Randolph Union High School and I live in Randolph. Okay, thanks. Um, Megan O'Toole.
I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I wanted to make um, a couple comments tonight. Uh, as a parent, um, my child is um, a student at Braintree Elementary, but also as a municipal official in the town of Braintree. Um, I'm the chair of the Braintree Select Board, and I get to participate in weekly calls with the with state health and public safety officials. Um, and I was also able to participate in the call with the Agency of Human Services and the Department of Health that happened a few weeks ago, specifically addressing the uptick in cases in Orange County that spiked a few weeks ago. And it's really clear for, to me from participating in these calls that the high case numbers that we've been seeing recently in the state, for the most part, and, and that were attribut attributable to the spike that happened a little while ago, um, are, are not attributable to the Randolph area. And I think while Vermont is a small state, I think local community data is really what should be informing our decisions about learning modality. This is the same data that other districts are using and there is no reason why this district should be any different. Um, still speaking as a local official, I was disappointed to hear how many people contacted by contact tracers during the event that caused the district to enter remote learning a few weeks ago that did not heed the requests of the contact tracers or were blatantly hostile towards efforts to contain further infection and keep people safe. However, what was equally troubling was the way in which that information was publicized and sensationalized. Our country and our communities are divided enough. And as Dr. Levine said last Friday, and I quote, we cannot let fear, gossip, and negative attitudes harm our efforts to stop this virus from spreading. Stigma can lead to people hiding their symptoms or illness and keeping them from seeking health care immediately. It can also lead to people not being forthcoming or fully honest with family, friends, and of course, the contact tracing workforce, end quote. People who are not doing their best to follow the rules should not be shamed if we are also trying to encourage them to quarantine and get tested. Okay, so now I'm speaking as a parent. <laughs> my family and I, with the help of my son's amazing teacher and the support of Braintree School, are doing our level best to see our son through this challenging time. In our house, we are fortunate enough to be able to make do with adjusting work schedules and ceasing work altogether to care for our son at home and facilitate his learning. We're following the rules. We haven't seen anyone outside of our household for several weeks, absent essential errands in town. However, over the past several weeks of remote only learning, we have seen our son regress in his social development and his mental health and wellness has also suffered. It is my belief that it is critical for the school district to conduct whatever amount of in-person learning is, safe, is, is safely to do at this time. While it is the view of some that switching back to hybrid right now is not worth doing because of the holiday break approaching or it's too disorienting for students, I respectfully disagree. Our children deserve the benefit of in-person learning as much as is possible. And with the data and case numbers showing that in-person learning is safe, then it should happen as soon as possible and for as long as possible. I want to highlight some of the other comments made by Dr. Levine and his mental health commissioner last week. They stressed the massive impact of COVID on the health of our communities, but what is also significant is the impact on our mental health and well-being. Our kids are feeling this too, and maybe more so than adults and the mental health impact to our kids and our society as a whole may not be recognized or fully quantified for some time. This in-person learning environment offers so much for kids, but in these times, the structure, routine, stability, and safety are most critical. I also want to again mention the issue of equity, which I have talked about at previous board meetings. Many school districts in surrounding counties and communities continue to offer in-person learning. Some of them have four to five days a week and most of them have higher case counts than here in the immediate Randolph community and surrounding towns. While I'm constantly impressed by the quality of learning that my son's teachers are able to make happen while he's learning from home, there is no substitute for in-person learning and the benefits derived in that modality. Therefore, this, there is an inequity that is occurring and accruing every day that my son is not in school learning, but his peers in the majority of neighboring towns and districts are in person four to five days a week. This is not fair, and it is frustrating that these, these districts can accommodate this modality of learning, but our district cannot. And, but I understand that going back to hybrid in a measured way is appropriate at this time. 
while we are lucky enough to have the resources to, to do our best by our kid in these challenging times, I don't have the proper training or resources to make sure that he stays on track and is getting the full benefit of everything that makes Braintree the wonderful school and place that it is. Again, speaking as a local official, I know how hard it is to make tough decisions that impact many. Local officials are not popular, but that's not why we volunteer for these roles in our community. It is almost always impossible to make a decision that makes everyone happy. What is possible is to make educated and well-reasoned decisions after hearing as many diverse viewpoints as possible and being informed by the highest and best data from reliable sources and experts. That is the best that we can do. Thank you for taking my comments. Thanks. Well, we certainly are hearing from a large number of people. So at least we got an A on that part of your, your critique. Um, thanks. And Melissa Kill. Hi, um, Melissa here. Um, I'm the health careers instructor at RTCC. I really did not want to follow Megan O'Toole. That was a beautiful speech. Um, mine is not as well planned out. Um, I ha First, I have a question um, for Mr. Millington. Um, earlier, you had mentioned that once we go remote, or once we go hybrid, we will not go back to remote, I, if I was understanding you correctly. And then later, you had stated that you were going to watch, and if you needed to, you would pull back. So I'm just kind of confused on what your plan is for that. Um, my biggest concern is that we are pulling the students in so many different directions with, yes, you're going to be here. No, you're not. Yes, no. Oh, whoops. Oh, we forgot. No. So um, I was just hoping you might be able to clarify that for me first. Yeah. So the um, pullback in this case means to hold off on the next step in the transition, right? It's put in in phases, and if conditions aren't right, we don't move to the next step. But to make sure that the continuity is there for both the teachers and the students, um, once we move into the hybrid modality again, then we deal with it on a much smaller scale, um, you know, as small a scale as we have to. If we're able to quickly identify the three people that need to be out of the, the building today, then they're out and everybody is back in tomorrow. Um, it's not these long shutdowns. It's not, um, you know, whole schools that, that have to go down. A lot of that depends on how fast we can get the information. Though. But the idea is that, you know, at most a classroom, you know, could be going out. You know, if it's at the elementary school or if it's the high school, it's a pod. So I, I understand that in a perfect world, that would be ideal. But given when this happened just three weeks ago, 30 to 40 percent, of the people that our tracers tried to contact refused to cooperate. What is gonna keep that from happening again in the future? Well, and then are we gonna be stuck in this position where we're hybrid and our COVID cases are, like if we look at um, Washington County, their numbers are almost triple ours. All of their schools are in session. So how much of that do, does that play into it? I know that our numbers right now may look reassuring compared to Washington County, yeah. but is that because we're not in person? And then once we go into person, are we gonna be just like Washington County, Chittenden County? I mean, there's there's just so much unknown. And that's why you keep a track of what the context is and move forward when it's appropriate to do so. Um, the plan that was put into place, like I said, took a considerable amount of thought um, to try to match up with the mitigations we're gonna be out in the community um, based on right when coronaviruses start to wane after the winter months, based upon the fact that we've got the vaccines that'll be coming out hopefully by the end of this month the increase in the vaccines over time, everything was timed um, to try to plan it out so that as we're potentially increasing risk because we're bringing more students back, the actual risks in the world outside are going down. In terms of the parents and the communities and what they're up to, let's be honest, regardless of what learning modality we're in, we have no control over what they do. The things that we do have control over is keeping students as safe as possible while they're here, which means taking a much more aggressive stance on, hey, you know, I've got reasonable intelligence that says you guys weren't doing what you were supposed to last weekend, so you know what? 
I need you to have your kids out of this district for the next 14 days, and that's non-negotiable. Um, so that people kind of get the message that it's serious. We got to do our part, you know, when we're in the schools, making sure that the people that are letting the masks fall down below their nose, you know, are making sure, reminding them to pull it up and making sure that they're following the protocols that they need to do as well. Um, so there are things that we can do that are within our control. We maximize those. And at this point in time, we have to accept the fact that the folks out in the community that aren't doing their part, I have no control over that. Other than the fact that if it's reported to me or it's reported to administration that we know who they are, we know what they've done, that, you know, they will be told, hey, you know, we're not beating you up for your choices at all. That's not our job. Our job is to make sure our kids are safe and we have re reason to believe that, you know, you should be in quarantine right now. So you will not be stepping on the school grounds until those 14 days are up. And I, I, I completely agree with that. And I just want to, I'm reading the comments as I'm talking about this. And one of them was um, about how um, the teachers are back in, in the school when this happens. So <clears throat> in my classroom, I don't have the space for my full class. Also, there have been no precautions. No, mm -hmm. I, I'm not supplied PPE by the district. I'm not, there are no dividers in my classroom. I have no, I have nothing. I have a fabric face mask that I bought from the chef's market. Um, and I spend probably realistically an hour a day telling students to keep their masks on. You know, so and like, you'll have to explain to me why there's no PPE because we bought tons of it. I've got 900,000 in additional equipment and PPE supplies that are there. So I really suggest you talk with Felicia. I can't answer that question. Um, in terms of dividers, um, the gu current guidance is saying that the dividers are, are pretty much worthless, um, that you cannot use them to extend social distancing at all. You're, what, you're welcome to use them, um, but in terms of social distancing, having a divider doesn't decrease that space. And so as we start to look at potentially going back to, to full in-person, um, yours would be one of the spaces that we would be looking at potentially moving the students to somewhere else where there's more space. I already have the largest classroom in the tech center. So, I mean, there's just a lot, and I'm not talking about whether we should start on the 14th. Yes, we need to get back, but I think that there's a lot more to it than we're, we're seeing. And my fear is that we go back just to get pulled out again. And that's what I don't want to happen. Believe me, I want to go back. I'm trying to teach a classroom of 14 students while helping my second grader do all of her work, and it is miserable. I want to I want to be back, but I want it done safely. And I and I want <clears throat> I want I don't want to attend my coworkers' funerals. I'm 30. I'll be fine. But I work with a lot of people that are over 60, and I don't want to attend their funerals. And again, and I would not be proposing this at all. And I can't believe that people don't believe me on this if I didn't have the data and felt secure in it as it exists right now. Um, that's all I can say. I'm, I'm not going to change your mind. I'm not going to convince you that's not my goal. Um, but a significant amount of thought went into this over Thanksgiving, um, has gone into it ever since. Um, and it is based upon the best that we can pull from what we know right here and right now. And our cases right now in and around Orange County, again, across the, all of Orange County, are running about three per day. We're in a very good spot. But we're also not in person with school is what my concern is. And when I bring up Washington County and they are in school four days a week, 17 kids in a second grade classroom, their numbers are triple ours. So what's going to stop our numbers from tripling once we go back to in person? If we're, if we're looking at... Um, you know, the, the, the numbers that we have, the num what we have to go off of, what's going to what's gonna prevent us from becoming Washington County? And mm -hmm. Lane, and Mr. Miller, in no way do I not trust you through this whole thing. I have said that you are doing a fantastic job. These are just the concerns that I have. I Washington County happened at a time when athletics was occurring and people were being allowed to come in from out of state 
because the state government opened up the spigots in terms of restrictions too much and had to pull back. And Washington County has been paying that price ever since. We're not Washington County right now. Now, the concern that is legitimate is we do have a lot of students, um, right, school choice. We've got the tech center that do come from Washington County, which is why our screening um, has to be top notch. Um, and it's why we have to follow through kind of on those extended pieces that I spoke of. Um, and we do have faculty that comes from, that lives in Washington County. And that's why that screening and that honesty piece is so darn important. It, can it fail? Yeah, you're right, it can. Anything can. There is always risk no matter what we do. Um, but there comes a point in time where you have to balance that risk with benefit. I can't control what people are going to do on the outside. I hope they do the right thing. I have faith that most of them will. What I can control is the quality of education we provide to students. And the best way to provide a quality education for students is to get them back in school as soon as it's safe to do so. That's the only argument I've got for you, Melissa. And I do appreciate your comments. You're awesome. Believe me. It, it's not, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mean to argue. It's, I just have like these real concerns. Like, I mean, I want to be back in person. I miss my kids. My daughter has said many, many times that she likes in-person school better. And it is the best thing. I have a 13 year old niece who's doing horrible with the isolation. A lot of the teenagers are doing terrible with the isolation. Well, uh, yeah. let, let me, let, because there's, there's other people that'll want questions too. Let me leave you with a thought. I'll tell you what my biggest worry is, right? Everything that we know about coronavirus, remember this is a novel coronavirus, which means it's new. It's only been around for nine months. All the guidance and all the directives that we get that are designed to keep us safe are based upon research. Research is just telling us the best truth they have based on the current evidence that they have at their disposal, and it changes over time. My biggest concern, especially since the focus of this discussion um, is on bringing back the younger students, is this. I worry um, that we don't have enough information to really make an informed decision. Why? because there is no research out there that tells us potentially what the long-term impact of, of having caught coronavirus is on young and developing children. I don't believe that there's gonna be an impact, but because we won't have that information for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, I don't know. Of all the things that we've talked about tonight, that's the one that keeps me up. Thank you. Well, I'll throw that out there to balance balance um, balance the conversation a little bit. <clears throat> Tev Kelman. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, Tev Kelman. I teach at the high school. I'm the vice president of the teachers union and support staff union. Um, and yeah, I'll just echo what Dr. White said. I'm really, really glad I'm not in your shoes tonight. You all have a really tough job and I really appreciate you listening to all of us. Um, I, I wanna make a, a couple points and finish by asking Lane a question. I'll try to make it, make it quick. Um, one is that I think I just really wanna speak to the fact that um, this, this pandemic has put us all in a horrible position, right? It's put parents in a horrible position, it has put every class of worker, but we're talking about schools right now, but it's put anyone who works in a school in a horrible position. And mm -hmm. lots of us fall into both of those categories, myself included. Um, and I, I just regret so much um, when it feels like this discussion ends up being parents versus teachers and support staff with kids as the ball and support and the board having to um, pick winners or losers. And I don't think that that's anybody's intention. And I think, you know, I agree with those who've been saying in the chat and out loud that we really need to um, be respectful of each other and compassionate for, for where we're coming from. Um, I recognize a lot of desperation in, in what parents are hearing. And I rec and I, as somebody who works with young people, I can say that I don't think there's a colleague that I've spoken to who is not deeply aware of the mental health and social emotional impact of this pandemic on kids. And 
absolutely we understand better than anybody probably except for the parents and the kids themselves um how how deep that impact is so i just want to, to say that while also saying you know as you heard 85 between 80 and 85 percent of our members felt pretty strongly that now is not the time to return to any sort of remote learning um i think that there's a wide variety of of feelings about um what the best way to manage the priorities of safety and stability and predictability which are essential to run a school and have kids learn with obviously the need to get as kids as back in person as much as possible but i have to say there have been some really scary things that we've heard as school workers right and, and certainly the statistic that's that's been um tossed around about the 30 to 40 percent of people not cooperating with contact tracing is one of them, I'd love to hear, maybe when I finally stop talking soon from Lane, just if, if there was like new data or new information to, to make us feel more confident about the fact that people are gonna be more cooperative because I think I heard in your rationale, a lot of good ideas provided that people cooperate. Um, but as somebody who needs to go to work in that building and who represents people, including people with underlying conditions, who go to work in that building um we need more than hopefully people will do better at this time um and we know that you know i've heard in these meetings i've heard community members say something to the effect of i feel like if this is like a game of russian roulette i'm ready to play which i'm sure was not meant you know i'm sure that was a, a metaphor but nevertheless that's a that's a scary thing to hear um and um you know, it's it's scary and confusing as somebody working in a school to hear statistics talking about how minimal the likelihood that uh, transmission will occur within a school when we know that it's happened in our school, right? I have a colleague who got COVID-19 at work. Um, so, you know, as individual human beings have to go in and do this job, and th those are serious questions. I would just hope that even those who desperately want kids back in school, understand that that's where we're coming from. It's not out of a desire as, I don't think this was the implication athlete, Ashley, I certainly hope it wasn't, but like that people are, are somehow using this to take a vacation. Remote teaching is extremely difficult. It sucks, excuse my language. It sucks so much worse if you have kids at home. Um, but I think, I, I, I appreciate, Lane, what you said about folks having legitimate reasons to be afraid. And I, and I do think that, you know, the nature of COVID is that the time when you're spreading it, it comes before the time when you have symptoms, rendering a lot of the screening and checking procedures tough. I understand that it's a low, a low number, low case rate, but I also feel like having seen what death does to a community, you know, by working in a school, I think that we need to weigh really seriously the risk that we're taking and even taking like a low risk of death. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think that's all that I wanted to say. I appreciate you listening to me. And I guess my, my, just you got my question about like, was there was there some new data or, or new reason to think that people would behave better this time? Um, like I said, and, and again, in terms of the parent side, the simple fact that our numbers are low right now, following Thanksgiving when they should be spiking like the rest of the state, indicates that more people must have gotten the message, otherwise our, our, our results would be higher. Oh, another very good number to throw out there, and uh, hopefully the staff have heard this, but um, we had 90, I think it was 98 that were set up to do that surveillance testing. I think 96 uh, made it through and got the results back, zero. So there were no unknown cases in, in the district. No, no staff um, came back positive from that, that surveillance testing, which was good. Which to you as staff, that's a kudos. You're doing what you need to do to protect yourselves while you're here. So like I said, there is good data. One of the things that I always worry an awful lot about, especially in the midst of a crisis, is, is people should be anxious. There, there's a level of anxiety that should exist. The question is, should it be here, should it be here, or should it be here? I think it should be about here, but it's up here for a lot of people. And part of the job as we try to make the transition 
is to bring people's perceived anxiety down to where it really should be. And one of the ways to do that is before we start to make this transition to full in-person instruction, um, and with Ashley's help, is inviting the medical folks from uh, Gifford to come out and actually have some conversations with the faculty, have some conversations remotely with the community so that they can ask those questions, those burning questions that folks have that are making them anxious. Those doctors are going to give you straight answers, right? And if those answers are coming back that we shouldn't go back, believe me, we'll change, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll change our, our thought patterns. Um, but, but I think that's an important step in this process is, 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 is talking to that spirit in a little bit um, that, that folks have and hoping to get their anxieties in line where the, the level is that, that, that's reasonable and where it should be. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Richard Hayward. Hi, I'm Richard Hayward. I teach at the uh, Brookfield Elementary School. And I just want to preface this by saying that um, I do appreciate, Lane, that you have this data that you've spent more time analyzing. So I'm not uh, dismissing that at all. And I really appreciate what the way you have backed us up as a faculty throughout this crisis. Um, I guess my comment here is I'm a, I was a little heartbroken this morning facing my class and telling them that we do, we want to be back and we're doing our best to get them back in person. We recognize how much they want that. However, while I'm telling them this, I'm also thinking in the back of my mind that I don't want to be in the building next week because I'm looking at the numbers statewide. I'm looking at the numbers countrywide. I'm looking at the Dr. Fauci saying that Christmas could be worse. Um, we are not fully past the, uh, the effect of Thanksgiving yet. I have so many parts here where I'm seeing where kids or families have in the past done things not not especially as it should have been done and then you know coming back and we have to create that conflict when we ask them and the child tells us one thing and the parent tells us them, uh, them another and we i feel like i'm driving a wedge between those kids and their parents when we have to do that i'm also like someone else said very nervous that we bring our we bring our kids back next week and then we have to close again in a couple of days now being remote until Christmas is is hard on the kids, on all of us. C coming back for two days and then having to go remote again would be crushing for everyone involved. Um, I'm also just nervous about um, ab about people not following the rules because I've I've just seen it in so many different places. I've seen people being uh, sort of treating it like they're they're the exception, but they they always have a justification, and it makes me very very nervous when. A lot of us have worked so hard to keep ourselves isolated, to keep our families safe. I haven't seen my parents in two years because they were meant to come this summer. I haven't seen them. My, pa my parents haven't seen their granddaughter at all in two years, and she's three. So it's crushing doing this stuff. And it is a, it's, it's like a kick in the face when you hear that people are not bothered about it and you know they're going to go and take their vacations and the and i've heard people say i'm just going to tell the school that i did everything right and i've heard this in other districts and i can't handle really having to face those kids and tell them we're doing their best uh look, that we're doing our best and then knowing that there are so many cases where people aren't and i really hope i'm not speaking for this community here i really hope um that the community here is doing everything they should be doing but these are the things that kind of float around, I'm sure around the back of every teacher's head when we're doing this stuff. So I want to be back in the classroom with those kids. I want them to be together, but not yet. I think this is too soon. No, I understood. And like I said, anxiety is a normal part of this. It would be, it would be abnormal if we weren't anxious. Thanks, Richard. Um, next, we've got Jeremy Lyford. This is actually Sadie here, and I'm not going to talk about anything emotional today. I'm actually just going to talk about some things that I want to set straight. So we do have some cases within our school system, Lane. I always call you out on the things that <laughs> you say that might not be correct, so I'm just calling you out on that. Um, well, I, I had emailed the two of you today to get that data, and I was told no, we have no positive cases as of as of today. Yes, from Beth. Yes. Um, 
So these are just the things that I've been thinking about and they don't necessarily need a comment, but I think we just all need to be thinking about different perspectives because I think we all get stuck at this time in what is our point of view. There is no one winning or losing. No one likes this. This is not the right thing for anyone. I think the amount of shaming that has happened across the board, no matter how you feel about this issue is atrocious and we are all human beings. And I think that we really need to start treating each other that way and stop just calling each other out on what you think they should be feeling. Um, I just wanna point out that RTCC, you know, we talk about families not being able to go and visit other families, but we're talking about RTCC, which has many sending schools, sending multiple kids from multiple schools all into one classroom. So I think we really need to think about it as a more global thing within our school district as not just Randolph, Brookfield and Braintree students. Um, Melissa, you had a question about PPE and you should contact me outside of this and I will hook you up, girl. Um, the mental health aspect is something that student services at the high school end, and I know in talking with the other district nurses that their um, guidance counselors work on very hard. We have lists of students, we talk with students, we visit, do home visits with students. If there's somebody that you feel like is slipping through the crack, then please let us know because we want to be able to help them in any way that we can. If that means going to their yard, sitting out in the freezing cold and giving them some social interaction, we're gonna do it. So please let us know that. Um, also know that we are looking at our classroom spaces and seeing how many students we can set up in there safely, all facing one direction, six feet apart. And anybody who thinks that we're not doing that, it's incorrect information. You can't fit 17 students six feet apart in a lot of these classrooms. And I am sorry about that because I really want to see all of them and be with them all the time. Um, so just know that that is going on. The other thing that I think that we forget about because we look at the pediatric rate of transmission and it is very low and the death rate is very low. However, how many of our students live with their grandparents or live with people who are at risk? How many of our faculty members are high risk? We also need to be thinking about our community as a whole, not just as the students. And so I think that's just something that we've really got to keep um, in our mindset. Again, <laughs> I want to see the students. I miss them painfully, but I also need to take into consideration who else is within our community. And then lastly, vaccine distribution. I've been through a few of them when I worked at Gifford Pediatrics. It's not a fast process and it's, it happens in small increments. This is a vaccine that's gonna be very temperature regulated, so that's gonna be tricky. Um, and then there's going to be a lot of people um, who don't want to vaccinate. And so you still have those people who are uncovered. So I, I just think that we need to be thinking about things as a holistic view. And lastly, just be kind to each other. Please be kind to each other. So I do need to correct something here, Sadie, your email from 1148 AM today, I will read it and I will have hand it out to the community if there's any questions. You, to quote you, I have not heard from the Department of Health and I don't have any positive cases. Was that incorrect? And then the other part of that is that I have, from outside of the school, I did not. I do have four faculty members in quarantine which I'm aware of, which we discussed today. Right, but those are not just because of travel. But these are not positive cases. There is, but I don't want to talk about it right now. I'll talk about it with you tomorrow. Sounds fine. Yeah, but again, coming into a high profile meeting and implying that I've misled people oh. on the information that I have, I'm a little concerned about. Okay, no, I'm sorry if that, um, Upset. Again, I have not heard from the Department of Health and I yep. don't have okay. any positive okay. cases. Well taken, Lane. Ta I've taken your point. Okay, Chris Armstrong, do you have something to, to say? 
Uh, yes, and um, I'm just going to read it because I've been there's been a lot we've talked about a lot and a lot of things are coming to mind. Um, I think no one's arguing that in person learning is best. The one thing that's unifying all of us teachers, parents, board members and community members is that we all want a full return to in person. Um, the question is the timeline. Numbers are consistently growing nationally and statewide. Dr. White stated that we are in the middle of the Thanksgiving spike. People are still getting tested from exposure during the break and we do not know the full extent of that break. Numbers after Halloween didn't skyrocket this quick and we won't know the true numbers for many days. You have over 80% of the teachers saying that they have serious concerns with coming back before the next break. Saying the staff is professional is absolutely correct. However, intentionally or not, I'm troubled by the implication that by being professional, you're coming back to working conditions that you view as hazardous during a national pandemic. I worry that we really don't have the staff to do this without forcing people into a difficult situation, and it's for the benefit of only a few days back in school. As Hannah said, and as others have echoed in the chat, at the last vote, you decided to wait and come back after the winter break. This was because not only is Thanksgiving a hard holiday to follow guidelines, but Christmas is probably even worse. As I said, we all want to be in person with the kids, but I believe that this vote is premature in addressing the current conditions. We really need to hold off and see what happens and then make a decision to reevaluate and come up with a new timeline. If things truly look good two weeks after the next break, then a phased return makes total sense. I just don't understand the need to rush this for such a short return. As Sadie has said, it's about keeping our community safe we could look back on this a year from now and say, wow, we really were a bit overcautious, or we could be looking back and wondering why we rushed and feeling the pain of those consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Shana Meyer Moyer. Shana Moyer. Shana Moyer, yes. Um, so I'm a teacher at Randolph Union High School. And there was um, a positive at our school. And the way I knew that there was a positive at our school was not because of Sadie or because of any announcement that came from Lane, but suddenly the attendance for that student's class dropped 50% because the kids all know who has and who hasn't doesn't have it and their parents chose not to send them. So for the week before we closed, I had a very tiny class <laughs> Um, honestly, there were like two kids in the class and I was trying to teach the kids that weren't in the class and the kids that were in the class. So if Lane opens the school on the 14th with a week before Christmas, there's a very good chance that we won't have full attendance from the community. And it's much easier as a teacher to teach 100% remote kids than it is to teach some kids who are there because their parents are sending them and some kids who aren't. I fully believe that we should go back to hybrid learning after Christmas break, but I feel like these three days that are coming up are not going to be very productive as a teacher. I know that what I'm gonna plan for these three days is gonna to have to be almost fluff or filler because kids aren't gonna come. Your kids, the people that have attended this board meeting, they'll probably be there, but there's quite a bit of Randolph families that are not gonna send their kids. And my father-in-law died of COVID-19 and he didn't get it because he was old. He got it because he came in contact with a kid or a, a younger adult who had it. And so just to worry about how kids contract it is totally ignoring the, the community members that are around you who are much older. Um, so I feel like right before Christmas break is not the time to bring us all back. When we're in remote this past week, I have had better attendance from these kids than I've had almost the whole year because it's very easy for them to log into a computer screen and their parents aren't worried about them getting sick and they aren't worried about them giving it to their grandfather. And so they're, I had almost 100% attendance last week. And when I call, I can even call families during these remote classes and be like, where's your child? And they can go wake them up out of bed and put them on the computer screen. So we've had real, I, I'm surprised at the parents that are saying that the kids aren't doing work during remote classes because I've had, I teach 10th grade and I've had really, really good a response from the kids this past week. And Kathy Ingalls works with me. She would attest, we're, we're getting some good work out of these kids during the remote session. They're trying hard to cooperate with us and the attendance has been great. So there are some positives about going remote, even if long-term that's not the plan. For right now, with people in the community afraid of what's going on at the schools, we're getting some positive reactions from this. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to state, I have forgotten. So, <laughs> thank you. All right, um, Evan Brownell. All right, so I am an eighth grade student at the school and I have been reading the chat a lot and I have noticed that, um, and people have been speaking about it too. I've also, I've noticed that mental health is a very big um, concern for a lot of people. Um, and so I just wanted to state some stuff about that. So I myself do meet with someone uh, from the school and it, uh, he has um, reached out to me um, consistently and has checked in and I, um, and so I think that can kind of, and he, he tells me about that he has, you know, he has very, he has a lot of students that he um, talks to and, um, you know, visits with and does Google Meets. I actually just, um, I just had a meeting with him on Friday and he was telling me that, you know, he meets with probably a hundred people from the middle and high school. And, and so that's, so that's some clarification on the mental health issue. Um, another thing is that with the amount that is learned, that is, the amount of work that us students are doing, I don't seem, I don't feel like I am not getting enough work. And I feel like, yeah, you know what? I am getting less work than I would in school, but I, I can expect that. And so I don't think I, I mean, I'm not getting no work at all. Um, you know, my teachers give me probably two assignments per class for my two independent days. And I think it actually works out pretty well. Um, yes, I love going to school and being in person and interacting with um, a bunch of my friends and teachers and I get along with all of them and I'm, um, I, I'm very, um, very grateful that I have the opportunity or have had um, to at least go in two days a week this year. Um, because remote learning last year was a lot more confusing because it wasn't as organized and you know so um it is definitely a lot better this year and things are more clear and yes as uh i would call him mr millington would say um as he said um yes there's a lot of anxiety um i certainly get anxiety from it um and a lot of people, and a lot of people do. And I've been talking to my classmates and they all say, they, of course, they all want to go back to school. You know, they want to see everyone. Um, and they have been stating to me that they do get um, very anxious. And um, I, I just have one more thing to say. I won't keep talking, even though I love it. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, I love everything about the school and I think it's a great school. Um, we have some very intelligent teachers and um, my teachers certainly um, do very well with their, um, with what they teach. Um, and they're very clear and, um, so I just, I think, yeah, of course I want to go back to school. Of course I do. You know, even the three days, I would just, I would just adore that, you know, just to be able to um, just see everyone again and 
be able to communicate and just it would be great but that's uh that's my perspective um on the whole thing so thank you very much for your time i appreciate it thanks evan for speaking up uh matthew fordham fordham yeah good evening all thanks uh, i appreciate the time um so I, I did jump on late, so I haven't heard all the comments. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, I do appreciate for sure is the teachers out here. And I, um, you know, run a business, and I can appreciate the anxiety and the challenge that it comes for having folks that are remote, uh, hybrid, and in person, and the challenge. We've lost you, Matt. Here's an example of what's wrong with remote learning. <laughs> Matt, Matt we'll have to we'll have to get back to you, I guess. Uh, we've lost right, you. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. Sorry, my headset. So I guess I just wanted to say two things. One is that uh, mm -hmm. Noreen and I have a tenth grader in the school system. Um, who has, you know, next to zero work, um, and he does attend the classes as required, but, you know, he's twice made the comment in the last week, the only homework that he has or the most work he has is driver's ed. And when we think about the challenges that are out there that are going to face our students as they continue to grow their education, their careers, what happens next, you know, in the math, the sciences, the English is when they go on to the next year and what's preparing them for their next stages in life. And, um, I, again, I have a full appreciation for the teachers, but to, to even pretend that they're getting the same quality of education that they would get in the in-person learning is just not factual uh, for our child and certainly the, the friend group that he keeps. The second point that I want to make is, you know, while I understand that there's a fear and I do appreciate that this virus is a 3x uh, contain, contains, uh factor over the normal flu virus, um, you know, we have 623,989 people in this state. And out of that, we've had a total of 5,080 people test positive uh, for this virus in the nine, 10 months this has been going on. To put that in perspective, that's 0.8% of our entire population in the state. That's less than one-tenth of 1%, so, or 1%, or less than 1% here. The total test, 586,309, which is 0.86% of tested positive. 2,996 people have recovered from this, which means that that is a 0.3% affected population in our state right now, 0.3%. So if we say that you have a 99.7% chance of not having this virus, I take those odds, honestly. And if I have a 99.2% chance of not catching it because only 0.8% of the population has, I take those odds. And now if you narrow that down to Orange County, right, the percentage of Orange County is even way lower, the positive cases to the total number of people. So I appreciate the fears. We can watch the news networks. We can look at the data. But I just ask that we look at the data and keep a perspective of what's, what's actual versus what is generated through fear. And if we do have a fear, let's address the fears rather than uh, what we think that the problem could be. And again, I appreciate all the teachers out there, appreciate the administrations going through this. But again, I think that there's a challenge here with what numbers are versus what, what the fear is being created out of this. That's all I have. All right, thanks for uh, speaking up. Um, Molly Mullen. <sighs> nope. Hi, go ahead. Oh. Nope. Oh, am I on? Sorry, my computer's not working. We can hear you. Perfect. Um, so I was just curious about the survey that you sent out um, three days ago that I just found in my email today. Um, what are your leads on child care, if any, at this point? Um, and 
are you going to be sending out a survey to parents about remote versus hybrid versus full in in person um i'm thankful for all of the teachers who are speaking up and sharing their hardships and how you know they want to go back to school just as much as the parents um but i'm having a hard time believing that there's not more parents speaking up on this meeting tonight um we've heard from board members and teachers but a very small handful of parents um and i keep get i keep seeing comments like we want the school parents only want the school to for child care or for babysitting and that's not at all my point whenever i speak up in these meetings i don't i don't want them for child care or to babysit i i want my son in school full time to learn and to grow my son today looked me my 7 year old son today looked me in the eye and said mom when is this all going to be over? When can we go back to school? And it broke my heart to tell him that I don't know. I don't know. I they asked Sorry, we seem to have lost Molly. Um Maybe she'll pop back on, maybe not. This is the trouble. Um, all right, um, we'll let Molly come back if she is able to get back on. Um, Brittany Buckholtz, you're next. Hi, I am Brittany Buckholtz. I am a student at RTCC in the Health Careers Program. Um, I want to say that the um, Health Careers Program at RTC has changed my academic life completely. Um, before this year, I had major plans to become a cosmetologist and um, do makeup for a living. So my path has changed drastically. and. Um, the teachers at RTCC are solely to blame for that because I fell in love with the medical field the first day I stepped into the classroom and saw two um, training dummies laying in the hospital beds and the wheelchairs and the crutches. And um, I knew that I was supposed to be there. And my biggest worry when I think about not going to school is um, what if I can't go back and I don't end up getting my LNA this year? Um, I think that would be moving me backwards in life and that would really be putting me back in that place of stuck and not really know um, where I'm where I'm headed. I think for the other programs, the health careers program is highly respected in our community and the students who go in the health careers have high expectations of them and we are expected to do our work on time and we are expected to teach ourselves with the help of our teacher, Melissa, who is my best friend. And I think that we have to consider the difficulty that the students who are as fortunate are having. Because I, I go to school and I see that the times that we are even in school during hybrid learning, that students are still struggling to get their work done. And there are times where we log on and there are multiple days where students aren't showing up and it's bringing the classes behind 
and we just we need to have the in-person motivation and the social aspect of school and we need to be able to be there for each other and do it together and get through it together so I'm really concerned about my education. I'm concerned about the education of my peers, but I also respect the teachers on a completely different level. And I respect that they are at risk more than I might be or more than any of my peers might be. And I respect that we need to find the the balance between that in order to figure out where we need to go next. So it's not really going to, it's not, it's not up to either side of the school board or the parents or the students or the CDC. It's going to be all of it as a community deciding what are we going to sacrifice in order to make it so that our education can proceed in a way that we want it to, in a way that we feel safe going into our school buildings and um, having what could be an almost normal high school experience. <laughs> but um, I will stop rambling. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, Brittany. Brittany. That was very well said, very uh, eloquently put the, the dilemma that we are all in. So I appreciate that. Um, next, uh, Christina DiNicola. Hi there. Um, I just want to echo Brittany. Um, I also want to echo what Josh White had presented earlier in the evening, Dr. Josh White. Um, that we've come a long way since last March and what we know now about this virus is much more informed. Um, he mentioned that honestly at this point there's a higher chance of being killed in a car wreck and we're not talking about, you know, kids walking to school from now on. Um, I think we have to get some perspective on it. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about, you know, the patients who have come to me expressing their struggles. Um, I'm worried about my own family. I'm worried about the fallout from all these school closures. Um, people are showing a, an incredible amount of resilience, and I'm so proud of the people that are showing that. Um, it's sometimes more than I can do <laughs> because of this whole situation, but I'm proud of them, and I try my best too. But I would love just to hear, um, you know, more about the plan again going forth, I think you said the date was January 18th. Um, I, I wanna hear about how we're gonna move forward from this, honestly. Um, and I'd like to hear, you know, what the more specific phase in plans are, if that's still possible and if we have enough time. Lane, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I can kind of talk through it. So let me, I got it up in front of me. Uh, da, da, da. So December of 2020, de December 7th, obviously, right, we're meeting here to talk about um, a potential return on December 14th. Um, talked about the reason for that was to give time uh, for the teachers to transition uh, effectively out of remote and back to the hybrid mode. Um, there's got to be some messaging that goes out to the community, which we've been doing regularly anyway, but making sure that people realize that our future depends um, upon everyone following the state's health and safety guidelines. Um, those who do not follow those guidelines for whatever reason must not enter onto district grounds, period, the end, and that will be strictly enforced. Um, if the district reasonably suspects that a family or staff member has violated the health and safety guidance and needs to quarantine, the district will not hesitate to require them to quarantine from school. Um, talk a little bit about those that are in quarantine, trying to get them back as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, right now, what we've been finding, unless it's changed, was that the Vermont Department of Health pop-up sites tend to get the results back to us the quickest. You know, it's usually a 24-hour turnaround time where, you know, some of the local doctors 
um, and hospitals um, have the longest longest turnaround time. Um, inviting medical professionals from Gifford to run live remote sessions with the community to talk about the known risks, to begin easing the community's anxieties prior to the phased return to full in-person learning. Um, won't talk about the logic during the December break, right? Um, start the messaging that we're planning on returning to full in-person beginning mid-January and letting people know that the district will continue to offer full remote instruction to those who have a legitimate need um, with the understanding that once they go fully remote, they cannot change out of that mode until the end of the school year, until the national and local states of emergency are, are lifted. Um, January 2020, um, as part of its regular meeting on January 11th, the board will determine if a phased in return to full in-person learning modality should begin. Um, grades K to three would return on January 18th. On February 1st, the remaining elementary grades four through six, as well as middle, middle school grades seven and eight would return. Um, following the February break on March 8th, if it's possible, um, given, the, given the spacing requirements and the social distancing requirements at the time, grades nine and 10 would return. Um, in March, um, the tents would go up that we purchased um, so that we can get more students outside. And then if everything looks good on March 22nd, we return to a full five day schedule. Um, when we're talking um, going back to full in person in the early parts of these uh, phases, um, that is a four day, that's Monday through Thursday. Um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we still need the time. We need the time to let any of the droplets that are in the air to settle. And then the time for the cleaning crews to go in after that um, and do the, the strong disinfectant. That's, that's the deep cleaning that we talk about. But that's the basic plan in a, in a nutshell. Um, I won't go into the logic behind the parts and pieces behind it. Um, but if there's questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Christina, did you wanna follow up with Lane on that point? Um, I mean, I don't, I, at this point, I don't even, I don't know what to say. Um, I just, I just hope that we can get back to full time. I, I, when you, when you say you're going to phase in the K through twos first, is this, this is four days a week you had said? First? Yeah, it's four days a week at that yeah. point. In time, right. What we're trying to do is phase folks back in, um, so that we are mimicking hopefully the reduction in coronavirus cases in and around us, um, right? As time goes on, hopefully the vaccines are starting to take over a little bit and things get a little bit safer and a little bit safer. So we bring in more and more, um, but that's an early date that January 18th, there's not gonna be much vaccine activity at that point in time, January 18th. And are you gonna require um, teachers to get vaccinated? I have no ability to do that. Matter of fact, like I, we were talking about a little bit earlier, one of the reasons that, you know, I, I think, you know, myself and I think some of the teachers are anxious is, you know, we're expected to be working closely with, with kids in a congregate setting, but yet we're nowhere on the list in terms of vaccine. Um, as far as I know, we're, we're on the list with the general population. So who knows when that'll be. <clears throat> okay, so we're nearing nine o'clock here. I see a couple other people had um, indicated that they wanted to speak, comment, or question. Um, next on my list is an unknown. Um, does that person still want to ask a question or make a comment? Hearing none, there's a T. Reg or T. Raj. Hi, hello. Hi, go ahead. Hi. Uh, so my name's Tim Tim Rogers. I'm I'm one of the fathers of the uh, of one of the kids in in uh, kindergarten, um, and I'm also a uh, registered nurse, critical care registered nurse. Um, I've tried to sort of kind of go back and look. I joined this conversation a little late. Um, but I, I did want to just uh, take a, a moment to echo um, sort of what um, Dr. Dina Cola was saying. Um, 
I work in a very large medical facility, um, critical care. Um, and we, I took care of some of the sickest of the sick during the first round of this, uh, this uh, event or this pandemic. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is being, is we're seeing now um, is that the patients that we're seeing that we're admitting are a lot less sick than they were during the first round. Um, and I think that the academic data that's out there supports that. Um, and I think that there's a lot that uh, sort of needs to be um, looked at. In science, it's kind of always been, uh, you know, this, this, the science and medicine has always been uh, the, the notion that we follow data. We use state treatment driven data um, to, to drive our treatments and to drive sort of what we do. And I think there's a lot of data that's being presented right now, contrary to what we've been doing, um, worth looking at. Um, so that being said, I, I've, during the, the, the height of this thing, I've been questioning exactly what the collateral damage is that's being done secondary to all of this um, and how extensive it is in comparison to what we're seeing. Um, and I just want to take the time to echo that. We were very nervous as nurses, critical care nurses, first stepping into this realm. Um, and I think I, as time has gone on, we've kind of gotten used to treating it. Um, and it's just become sort of what we do. Um, so in that respect, I just wanted to, to, to put that out there. I think that right now I see what's happening with my children being out of school. And uh, I also see sort of the, the downside of the virus at work. Um, and it's just, it's not as bad as it was in the spring or at least seemingly at this point. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there for the community um, and for the teachers. I know you guys are scared and I appreciate what you're doing. Um, but I also, uh, I also, we were, we were very scared too, initially. And as time has gone on, um, you know, we've kind of gotten used to uh, what, what this, this entails. Um, and I think we've gotten better at treating it. I think we've gotten better at, uh, you know, picking up on the subtle cues of when patients are decompensating from it. Um, and I think the data is pointing in the opposite direction towards protecting the vulnerable and the elderly. And, um, you know, we, we can only go by what we, the data shows. That's, that's what we've always done in medicine. Um, so that's, that's all I wanted to offer to the discussion. Thanks very much. Are there other comments or questions from the public before the board starts to um, talk about some of these things and figure out what we're going to decide? Could I please? Can I say something? Sure, go ahead, Deb. Um, Deb Chamberlain, um, Brian Trey School, um, co president of um, support staff. Um, my husband and I both have had COVID. This is our third week into it. We're better, um, but we still have days. Um, the the stress is pretty high. Um, I was very sick. Um, managed to stay out of the hospital with my husband talking with the doctors about every other day um, to keep me home. Um, my husband got it first. We have no idea where he got it from. He works and he goes to Shaw's. So the it's not just the people that are traveling around. It's not the people that are out doing what they aren't supposed to do. Um, so that that's a challenge. The stress that I had on my own head, other people, particularly my mother, who I was with a couple of days before I got sick. Um, Hi, Deb. I'm sorry. I think somebody has their mic on. That could be my dog, that you hear the squeaking. So I would rather have a... T, you're... Yeah, yeah there we go. Thank you. Um, so my mother ended up not getting sick. She lives at Jocelyn House, so I was very concerned about passing it there. Um, but what was helped me a lot is I got sick on Monday night. I felt fine all day Monday. We happened to have been remote that day. 
if we weren't remote, I would have been at school. And thank God that we were in remote. I am in every classroom um, and then doing after school with another school and other people, not staying three feet because you just can't with a lot of the little children um, on top of if you need support with a child, you have another adult with you. Um, it was just very scary. And so I would hope that we wait until after the holidays to get everybody back. And I would hope at that point we can start transitioning to bring everybody back in. But I would prefer to have those other few days um, just just to give us a couple more days. I just wanted to share my personal thing on that. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you're feeling better. Are there other comments or questions? May I just say like like two more sentences, please? Sure, go ahead. Um, I just, I also wanted to point out the fact that um, it has been very hard to learn new information um, during remote learning. Um, I guess, I guess for me, uh, of course, I'm not like anybody else, but for me, when I have someone right next to me explaining everything, and it just, it just is so much clearer than um, over this, over a screen, but um, I promised I wouldn't say very much, even though I love talking. Um, I could do this all day. But uh, I just, yeah, I think a lot of the work we've done in remote learning, I'm not saying all, but I think a lot has been review. Because I, I also think that teachers find it very hard to teach new things. And so that's where the in-person two days a week helped. Because that's where we would um get topics introduced to us and we would get an explanation and then on a remote day we would do most of our work that we had to do and then on see i went tuesday thursday and then on thursday we would go over the work we did on the remote day and see it was a really 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 good schedule really well organized and i give credit to anyone who had any dis, um this or any um input in the making of that schedule that's all i had to say thank you for your time once again all right thank you all right um is there anyone else before we begin to deliberate a little bit I just want to say as a really quickly as a teacher of civics, um, this is a really amazing meeting to be a part of with students and parents and school employees and a state legislator, um, like a couple hundred people talking about this. Um, and while I have strong feelings about this, I just really appreciate everyone who's spoken on both sides. So thank you. I yes. just can I just say one quick thing? I just want to say as a teacher, um, we we want to be there. We want to teach the kids more than I think anyone can understand. Um, and uh, in no way is remote teaching easier on us. Um, it's probably twice the amount of work. So whatever decisions made by the board, I know myself and my colleagues will continue to teach your children and the children of this community as best as we can. And I just really want that to be clear because I feel like this has turned into a teachers versus parents. And as a teacher and a parent, whatever decision is made, I will fully support and I will do my best to make sure that every child gets what they need. <laughs> Okay. Um, if it's okay. No, no, you don't need to. I just wanted to yeah, mention I think there are people that have called in that are trying to no, speak no, but can't. Um, so, yeah, I see. Um, 
<laughs> two of you are talking at the same time, which happens in these things. Um, I heard that Megan said that um, people were trying to call in and haven't been able to say something. Brittany, um, did you have something more you wanted to say before we uh, deliberate? Of um, what Melissa said about um, teaching the students to the, their ability because I believe that the stability plays a big part in how well the teachers can prepare for us to um, learn what we need to learn for, for that certain unit or subject or and I think that as was stated before being ripped out again when we we need the stability of learning is not going to help us after the winter break and when we when we get pulled out of school on that sunday night we get the phone call saying oh next week you're not going to be in school i know that my teacher is panicking trying to make something for us to do on monday because she had different plans for inside the classroom. So the stability is is another major part of the quality of the education that we'll be getting. Thank you. Thank you. So there's one I person on the phone. Did you want to talk? Yes, yeah, sorry. This is Lindsay Hotz. I apologize. I was having trouble getting in um, or unmuting myself. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate and I guess um, go behind Ashley Lincoln, um, Josh White, Megan O'Toole, Christina Di Nicola, um, a lot of those folks um, in the medical field and the town, um, you know, official field who have really spent a lot of time interpreting the data. And I really ask the board to please use that information. Um, as people have said, the fear is unreal for every single person. And it's so hard to set that aside and not about your grandmother or your uncle or your husband or wife. But the data shows that there's limited spread in schools if we follow protocol. I work at a hospital. I was not given the choice of if I felt comfortable. It was a matter of this is your return date and this is what you will do. You will wear goggles and a mask and you will then treat your patient 10 feet away from you for an hour if that's what their appointment is scheduled for. And we ask patients all the health questions, but we recognize they're not always honest. And I think that's important to realize that every profession that can't be done solely on a computer and teaching is one of those needs to think about those things. Grocery store workers weren't given the choice. People at gas stations weren't given a choice. Um, ICU nurses that just spoke of less fear weren't given that choice, but we really sort of stepped up and said, we trust those around us that are saying, they've done their due diligence, whether it be your superintendent who's now changed his tone about how he feels because he can interpret the data and really take a second to show our kids that we will stand up to a little bit of fear, not because we wanna to go to our you know, coworkers funeral. As they said, the likelihood of you going to a coworkers funeral is more from a car accident. So putting that thought into people is scary. Melissa had asked about how do we make sure that the places like Williamstown's numbers aren't bigger because of the fact that their kids aren't in school. We know that because the data, the data still shows that in those counties, the spread isn't in schools, which is why the schools have stayed in session almost all year, four to five days a week in many of those surrounding communities. As a parent, it is disheartening to see many other teachers rise to the occasion. And while I appreciate that you have all so risen, to hear people say, we're just a little too scared to do it is hard when we've all not been given that choice. I respect the data is hard to interpret if you're not a medical person and haven't spent months interpreting it. So please set aside the fear and hear the professionals that are telling you it is safe and it is important. And all we need to do is wear masks and wash our hands and remind our children to do that and try as best as we can to stay at least 15 feet away for three 
to six feet. We need to hear the recommendation of three feet and not six feet and make a change. It is hard and it is scary, as Megan O'Toole said, to be one of those people that has to make that vote against a bunch of people that are scared. It's unfortunate that I've heard of parents that are unwilling to communicate at these meetings because of negative repercussions from teachers. We know that the majority of teachers aren't that way. We know the majority of parents are doing their best. We need to not let the few people, 30% or not, who are not listening, make the rest of our children suffer anymore. A lot of the concern I hear is around high school students and from high school teachers. If we need to, keep them out through break. But my seven-year-old, now eight-year-old, and my kindergartner need every second of socialization they can get. I'm watching my kindergartner, who has an amazing teacher, not move forward because you can't move ahead with a kid when the rest of the class isn't there. I just want to ask people to set the fear aside a little bit and hear the information that's presented because it's really, really valuable information, and it's been spent hours going over. So... I appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate the challenge that this is, but please take this task not lightly when considering whether we base it on fear or fact. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so that is the end of our public comment time. Um, we just don't have enough time to, to hear from everyone, unfortunately. Um, I do want to ask board members now to, you know, voice their opinion. What should we do at this juncture? Um, Lane's presented us a timeline for how we're going to move forward. What do we think? Um, do we want to tweak that timeline a little bit? Do we want to, you know, move forward as he suggested? Um, I'd love to hear what um, my fellow board members think. Uh, but just, I, silences are hard for me, so um, I'll speak first. This is Hannah Arias. Um, I um, feel the need to say something really quickly about kind of the identities that are being thrown around um, that parents aren't getting room to speak. There are teachers on here that are parents. There are board members on here that are parents. So um, I, I, I think it's misleading to say that parents aren't getting as much of a voice as, as these other identities. Um, I. I have done my best to be open-minded, to listen to everyone, to read as I was listening, which is tricky. Um, but I, and I uh, go back to what I said at the beginning, um, which is the, the vote that I took on the Thursday before Thanksgiving um, was based on fact, uh, the information we had then, that vote for me was to remain in remote session until conditions warranted a change from that. I still do not see conditions changing from that enough. And I don't think we've gotten to the day where we can make, where we can say they have changed enough based on data from Thanksgiving that we do not have yet um, to change that modality for the kids to be in school hybrid for that short amount of time. So I personally don't wanna take a vote tonight because I took my vote on that Thursday. Um, and I think we should stay with, I want to stay with what my vote was at that time, which is to stay in remote session. Um, the, the January 18th makes sense to me because it's two weeks after we return from the winter break. Um, I'll stop there. I reserve the right to speak again. Thank you. I'll go. Um, I do have, you know, I, it's balancing all of the comments that are made. I, you know, I'm so appreciative for all of those who've, who've shown up tonight, who've spoken openly about how they're feeling, both parents and teachers and students, which is fantastic to hear from students as well. Um, and it's just a lot to kind of 
take in and absorb too all the emotions and feelings behind this. Um, you know, and one thing that I am concerned about is the, I'm kind of questioning the return on the 18th. And the reason I'm saying that is because, um, unless I misheard, uh, I think it was said at the beginning of the meeting that um, perhaps some people, because of the extended Thanksgiving, felt it was safer to travel or safer to gather over Thanksgiving because there was some option for delayed quarantine and even Lane saying that some teachers are having to quarantine because of um, travel or interactions. So my concern would lay in if we are extending our return to full in person for two weeks after the Christmas break, um, you know, what precedent does that set for people to maintain the um, recommendations under executive order to not do multifamily gatherings, to remain in, you know, their family pods and not interact with others and not travel. Um, and I will say, you know, even reading comments, it's a little disheartening to see that that is already being stated, um, that that's a possibility. So my ultimate kind of request would be that we do not delay the return to July, to J January 18th, um, but proceed in the January 4th, as we would originally do, coming back from Christmas vacation. I guess I'll take my turn now. Um, I have agreed with mostly what, um, like Ashley said before, that the students aren't getting the education, or my my student, I will say. Um, I don't feel he's getting the education that he deserves. Um, I know the teachers are trying hard and they're working hard, but it's just not possible remotely. So my feeling is we should go back to hybrid as soon as possible and to full in person as soon as possible. But the numbers need to show it. And I feel that if we look at our district, our district is looking pretty good, just as Lane said. And that's the numbers that we should be really focusing on is the district specific numbers. So my feeling is, is that we should have a vote tonight and go with Lane's schedule to start hybrid on the 14th. And I feel that we should try to get to full in person as soon as possible. Um, this is Ashley Lincoln and I will go next. Um, I want to begin by thanking everybody uh, for their comments tonight. And I want to um, clarify that I do not think that this is by any way, um, any group against another group. Clearly, with the folks that we have joining these meetings, there are a lot of people who are um, very committed to the best for our kids. So I am going to circle back to some of my earlier comments and remind people that there was an executive order from our governor that did request um, no traveling that was not essential, that requires um, social distancing, it requires masks, um, it requires certain activities of every Vermonter. And listening to Deb speak um, and coming from a hospital background, I know that you can still get COVID by doing all of the right things that are asked. So the risk is there. We are not going to get to a zero number anytime soon. So that can't be the goal. For me, the goal is for the kids to be back in school. Um, I would like to see the kids back in if it has to be a hybrid model until the Christmas break. Um, that is what I would like to see. And yes, this is different than the uh, vote we took prior to Thanksgiving, but that's because this is an evolving situation and we have to be nimble and we have to be willing to make change. In addition, I also would like to see the kids um, starting with the elementary grades back in full person starting January 4th after the Christmas break. Um, at the school board, we asked early on at the start of the school year for those plans to be made so that could happen quickly. And I do strongly believe that starting with the elementary grades, 
they should be back in school on January 4th and then move forward with the other grades more quickly and not having it as dragged out um, all the way up to our juniors and seniors, they deserve to be in school as well. So that is my opinion and my vote. Hi, it's Megan Salt here. So I'm kind of on the fence here with everything. Um, I full heartedly agree that the kids need to be back in school four days a week in person um, for both the social and educational needs to be met. Um, I agree that they should go back full in person as soon as starting with K through two or K through three, whatever was mentioned. Um, beginning January 4th, I agree with that statement. Um, and then allowing the older grades as soon as possible, as soon as possible to get back in. Um, I don't know if letting the kids go back starting what the 14th, um, it's just a toss up. I don't know if it's the consistency. This was brought up the last meeting that we just had multiple times that consistency was really important. Um, it's hard for the kids to go back and forth. Do we send them back without knowing um, if everyone is quarantined after the Thanksgiving holiday? Um, I, I've said this multiple times. I wouldn't want to spread COVID to anybody. I wouldn't want anyone to spread it to me. Um, there was so many people that had, you know, may or may not followed the rules. We just didn't know. Um, the circumstances were just, I don't know, they were just so unclear. And at our last meeting, we voted to keep the kids fully remote through December. And I would like to, uh, I guess I would like to stay with that vote just because that's what we had agreed on. It made sense at the time and everything is just so unclear right now. So I'm Anne? a little confused. <laughs> this is Ann Kaplan. Um, because now we're talking about full in-person starting January 4th, which is totally, that isn't even in the plan that Lane put forth to us. So I'm a little surprised that we're going from remote to full in-person after the holiday break, which is a little bit uh I'm a little surprised that that's what we're talking about. I thought we were talking about whether or not we would go back to hybrid starting on the 14th of December and if whether or not that we thought that was a good idea and then starting maybe in full in person starting uh, January 18th. So I, I am definitely not on board with a January 4th full in person. Secondly, I would like some clarification, and I'm sure Lane knows who is in school four days a week in person, because I know it's not any of the high schools in our region. No one is doing that. Everyone is on a hybrid schedule. Maybe at the elementary school level or middle school level at those smaller schools, but I don't know of any school that is doing four days in person in our region and I serve those regions in my daytime work. So I'd like to know where that information is coming from because I don't, I haven't seen that. Um, so I would say I'm, I am still on the fence actually as to whether or not I agree with trying the hybrid again. It seems to me from what Lane has put forth and if he thinks he can staff it, that moving back to hybrid would make sense. We went remote, let's start easing back in and maybe try the hybrid again and see if we see a spike again in cases. Uh, it seems like we're, we are in a good position in Orange County. We're not seeing the numbers going way up. Uh, we are, I know we've got a few more days where we might get a little bit more um, 
we might get a little more data in, but it seems like we're back to where we were before and hybrid might be okay. The, the thing that I'm concerned about, and again, as a board member, we don't have that information is, are we gonna have staff to staff the schools? If we go back in, in to a hybrid situation, they may decide they, they don't wanna take the risk and they have sick time. So then we're looking for subs and we don't have enough subs as it is. So I guess uh, I'm, I'm still on the fence. I'm not exactly sure uh, what, what we're, what we should be doing. So I'll, I'll listen a little bit more and, and uh, check the chat and see what people are thinking. Lane, would you comment on, you proposed this uh, returning to hybrid uh, modality on December 14th. Do you think that we will have the staff necessary um, to you know, go back to a hybrid model then? We should, I mean, unless they are purposely taking the time off to avoid coming back to school, we should have the staff there. You got staff here, I'd ask them. Well, you know, we I, I can't speak. I mean, again, there, there's an we got an MOU that says they should. Um, I mean, there's they are professionals, they're expected to act professionally. I mean, that's not a criticism, um, either, Chris. It's just we are professionals, our job is to act professionals and do what we're called upon to do as long as it's reasonable and just and not illegal. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> Does that mean Lane is putting it out there to have some of us speak? Because whatever the vote is, I will support. However, there's valid points that there will be student parents that will not send their students because they feel that there's still the big if, if protocol is followed, if everyone wears masks, if everyone doesn't go to social gatherings. So if we didn't have to have that huge if so lots of staff will if you say it's hybrid will be there however just know shanna's right there are parents that make the decision and they just say i'm not going to send my kids kids to school and then you are left with how do we teach all the kids that way so it's just something to think about i'll and support i support whatever decision you make and Kathy is exactly right. We do do expect two things to happen. I fully expect two things to happen. One is that we will get a, I don't know how many, we will get um, families that don't want their students here. Um, so we will lose some students that way, either homeschool or they'll be expecting to go to remote. Um, the other thing that will happen is we may have staff quit. We've lost five more since the last board meeting. Lane, I'll also just jump in, just speaking to that. Um, I wasn't implying that, that that's not the case. And I think in the chat, you're seeing a lot of people st saying, we will do whatever is called upon, right? Um, but you yourself said in previous meetings that there are a lot of staff that do fall into a high-risk category that because of certain guidelines have decided that they would um, go with hybrid, right? Um, yeah. since, that, since those decisions, a lot of stuff has changed. And, and my concern was that by saying simply they're all professionals, um, that almost puts a pressure on those people that would qualify um, and that do have legitimate medical reasons um, because of this to, to, it just puts them in a hard spot. And that's why, that's why yes, professionals, and, and I don't doubt anyone's commitment to their job and, and to the students of the community, um, but I do just worry about that, that implication and the way that it does come across when you say simply, um, they're professional, so everybody will return. Um, it just, I think that it's a little bit generalized and not taking into consideration all the different um, circumstances that everybody has to deal with. Um, I noticed a comment and I, I didn't see it quickly. I might not have seen all of it, but something about, well, then parents can have their kids go remote. And that isn't just like a switch. Like if your kids are on the hybrid model, and then you decide now you don't want to send them to school. You don't call up and say, okay, I want them remote now. So that, that there's more to it than just that option, I guess yeah. is how I will. So, do so yeah, the, the idea of the remote 
Yeah, I mean, again, it's in the plan is that um, if there is a, a medical necessity, if there is a true need for that student to be remote, you know, we will honor that. And Chris is right that there are, are some other teachers that were kind of on the cusp, depending upon what the risk level was, you know, that have a medical exclusion to be able to go out. Our job is to match those two together, right? Is, and that's kind of what we did at the start of the year is we had teachers that for, for very good reasons medically couldn't be here. They had to, had to be in the remote session. We had uh, parents that didn't want their children here that felt that it was appropriate to keep their children at home. Um, we were able to match those students with those teachers and things worked out. We are aware of the teachers, the number of teachers that are kind of on that cusp. So that has been taken into, into account in this consideration. Um, but what we would do with them if they do go out is try to match them up with those additional students that would now be in need. Um, it shouldn't be a problem in terms of hybrid. I would be more concerned about it as we start to make that progression towards full in-person. Um, but again, full in-person, the way the plan is, it's purposely later down the line. Um, and that was on purpose. So hopefully conditions are, are getting much better, not just here, but across the country so that the level of anxiety is going down when we reach that point in time. So no, very good comments. Okay, I guess, uh, Rachel, are you still with us? Um, did you, would you please weigh in as far as what you think we ought to be doing here? I'm still here. <laughs> Good. I don't, I don't have anything um, new or earth shattering to say. I, I am aware that we're talking about a period of time between now or between next Monday and the Christmas break. And we're talking about it being three days in person for each student, but then, but then there's also the consideration for the time that the time after the holiday break that we would not be out. So it's not just three days. Um, like I said at our last meeting, if this was an easy decision, if it was, if the path forward was very clear, then it, it would be an easy decision. And there's no one decision that's going to be right for everyone with all interest for all interested parties that's going to be the one they want or the, or the perfect one. Um, I think that the data right now supports having our children in school. So does that mean, Rachel, that you would be in favor of, um, of, of Lane's proposal then, of, of going to remote learning on December 14th and remaining in remote learning, I mean, uh, going into hybrid learning on December 14th and uh, starting to transition the younger kids, K2, on January 18th? Is, is that what you're, um, you're saying? Yeah, I would, um, I think our, our school administration um, has thought has has labored over this um, and thought seriously and carefully about it and uh, is in a very good decision in a very good position to make recommendations to us as a board and and I support um, Mr. Millington's recommendation. Okay, any other board member want to weigh in again, um, change their mind, add something? We haven't heard from you, Laura. No, it's, it's easier not to say anything, actually. Um, I, I, I could go to one of either way. I could see um, remaining remote now until the end of Christmas break and then starting hybrid on January 4th. I'm not in favor of putting it off any longer. I think, you know, I think families should expect that their kids would be in school and teachers should expect that they would be in school too. Um, and that therefore, you know, we, we hold the standard that, yeah, you know, we're all in this together. We're not going to travel over Christmas break, even though we'd love to. And, you know, here we are. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I'm here. I'm, I expect, you know, everyone to be sort of obeying the, the Vermont 
directives as far as that goes, and that would be best for everyone involved. Um, I don't know whether it's best to go, you know, to start hybrid next week. And, and I guess that in that I would defer to Lane and the administration if they've um, seen that they've done their work and their thinking and their planning for this, you know, I would hope that that would be, um, you know, that staff would be okay with that decision, um, you know, and, you know, if Lane happens to say, well, maybe we should wait and put that off until January 4th, right when the kids come back from break, we'll return to hybrid. I'd be okay with that too. So um, I could see either way. I don't want to put it off any longer than that, however. You know, I really think it's important that, you know, we start the new year with our kids in school as much as possible. So Lane, um, you've heard from all eight of us. Um, we vary somewhat, um, you know, and having heard from both parents and staff and um, everyone else involved, community members, um, is there anything about your proposal that you would like to change or amend? I, um can throw out just uh, just another observation. When we talk about the remaining time, again, we had intended to start on, the recommendation was gonna be for the ninth this Wednesday. Um, it was put off because people didn't do what they were supposed to. Um, that's the only reason to be putting it off to the 14th. Um, first observation. Second observation, when folks say that it's only three days for the kids, how many days is it for the parents that are taking care of the kids? Because we've forgotten, I think, a little bit in this discussion about the impact that this is also having on the parents. We've got a 40% poverty rate in this district. We've got parents whose livelihood depends upon their ability to get to work, and a lot of them can't do that if their students are at home and they have to watch them. And we have also entered the heating season when money is tight for everyone. So I would argue that if we are able to go back as soon as possible, that's reasonable, that's well-planned, that's thought out, that is in conjunction with the conditions around us, which are pretty darn good right now, that we should do it. Because yes, we got to take the teachers into account. They're incredibly important. That's why the plan spread things out as much as it did was to give people a chance for the anxiety as, as things go well, and hopefully they do go well, for the anxiety to go down so that we're bringing them along with us and not, not forcing them into something too quickly. Um, but I don't want to forget about that impact on, on the parents and the people in the community. <clears throat> and I'll leave, leave it at that. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why the hybrid, at least that, that, that gives them, if we start next week, at least that gives parents a, a little bit of a break and a little bit of a breathing, breathing room. Um, but. I wanted to ask Hannah, she, when she gave her opinion, she said she would reserve her right to um, say something again. Hannah, did you want to add anything? Uh, just a um, clarification that uh, I, I don't remember who said, but that we should um, stand behind Lane and, and the cabinet who see more than we do um, on a kind of umbrella level. And I think that Lane had started out by saying that it wasn't necessarily unanimously. The cabinet was mixed. Cabinet was mixed. So I, I just wanted to clarify that um, because I, I, I don't want to set up a, if I vote a certain way, then that's like a vote of no confidence in, um, the cabinet. So thank you, Laura, for remembering me saying that. I didn't. Does anyone else, uh, any other board member want to say anything um, before we either make a motion to, to approve or amend um, Lane's transition proposal? Are there any further comments? Hearing none. Um, I, uh, sorry, Laura, it's Kathy again. I just wonder, are we saying an option could be that 
We don't do hybrid till after Christmas break. We come back the fourth and do hybrid and then start the in-person with the younger grades, January 18th. Are we saying that could be an option? Yeah, the board can propose whatever it whatever it likes. Okay, because as- The board as, can propose whatever they- we, Okay, we as that was morphing, I, I was thinking that, and this is of course only my opinion, I just thought that might bridge both sides. So that's it, I'm done. All right, so as a board, um, do we have a motion um, that we can consider? Is there something that we feel that all of us more or less could get behind? Um, that seems reasonable to everyone. Well, I, I guess I'll make a motion that we follow Lane's recommendations and move to hybrid on the 14th and then continue with the in-person starting on the 18th. Any further discussion about that motion? I guess I need to ask for a second first and then we can further discuss if need be. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? I wonder if we should revisit again before before we plan something. I mean, it seems like at our last vote, we were planning to not revisit this until the Christmas break, and here we are. So it seems like if we're making plans that far in the future, um, that makes me a little nervous. Maybe we should be considering revisiting before we make the plan for full remote. So that part of it, the plan um, actually has you or full, full in person. That's full in mean. person. The plan actually um, states explicitly that at your January 11th meeting that you will take a look at the conditions, decide if we're ready to start moving into that phase. And noting that this meeting is now at over three hours in length, and our <laughs> January meeting has all the business aspect of what we're doing that might not be the best time to chat about it again. No, no likely we may need a, an extra meeting in January, maybe preceding uh, whatever the first Monday is, preceding our January live, so that would be the 4th of yeah. January, I guess. I mean, maybe, um, right, maybe we can have, maybe we don't need to revisit, maybe everyone's comfortable voting for that to be the tentative plan, and then we revisit it if we need to. Well, believe me, I'll, I would call folks back together if it looks like things weren't viable, um, okay. if you have that, that faith and trust. And um, yeah, because it just, uh, it, again, I, I'm concerned about safety too. And I'm not, I'm not in this to put people in harm's way. Um, that, that, that's not the goal or the plan. I don't think any of us are, Lane. Nope. These are our neighbors. These are friends, teachers. So, um, Laura, could the motion just be for the immediate action prior to, um, you know, whether or not we go back to hybrid um, before the Christmas break and then talk about that next piece of back full in-person learning, however that is phased in, in another vote but not to clump the two together right now? We could. I mean, I think we would assume that hybrid learning would then continue after Christmas break. So uh, as of January 4th, we would remain in hybrid learning and then we could you know, revisit um, the transition to more in-person learning at that point. Is that what you're suggesting, Ashley? Yeah, I just think it's easier for me because again, this is evolving. Um, you know, the data is changing constantly. And I think we all agree that we, we have tremendous faith in Lane and the cabinet and the teachers to share the information with us. Um, but I'd rather just focus on, are we going back to hybrid or are we not at this point? 
that seems fair to me. Um, does that make it more tenable for others as well? So then when are we going to make a decision about the plan for after we come back on January 4th? When they come off of the break? Or do we just assume that that means we're hybrid until we have a meeting? Is that? And then we decide I guess. whether or not we're going to do this moving into phasing into full in person? Well, I mean, we're not going to know much more on January 4th because we'll just be coming back from the break and it, probably there will be some lag time uh, in COVID cases, or perhaps, I, don't, I have no idea, but that's a possibility. We're going to assume that we're going to continue in hybrid learning for a period of time. Um, I think it would be fair and to make a, a date at that point, hopefully at uh, that it we could see January 18th for um, transitioning the K2s into full in-person. That to me seems like a reasonable goal. Um, I guess at Janu on January 4th, we could revisit that. Um, if we knew something more, uh, we could know at least the state of things in Vermont um, and, and in Orange County at that point. Um, and maybe make a better informed decision. I guess that's possible. Were you suggesting we should um, think of some other way to, to revisit this decision, Anne? No, no, I just wondered when we we're gonna, when we we're gonna discuss or decide on the move, the move toward full in person. That's gonna be another meeting in January sometime. Are we doing that on January 11th or? Well, I think Lane was suggesting this or proposing this um, rollout uh, way to move to full in person over a gradual period. Um, right, I'm looking at the plan right now and that's why I'm sort of confused by, because in his plan he says on January 11th, the board will determine sort of going back to full in-person learning. And and is the propose I'm trying to understand what the motion is. So we're saying we're going to go we're going to vote for whether or not we want to go hybrid until we have this next meeting in January on the 11th. Is that what people are what is that what the proposal is? Would someone repeat the motion please for me? I think the motion was that we were um, to go forward with Lane's recommendation, which was to return to in-person, I mean, um, hybrid on the 14th of December and then proceed as is outlined in his recommendation, which would be, be obviously discussing it again on the 11th. But I also agree with Rachel that, um, you know, if it comes down to a large discussion again, we can't spend, you know, it, it needs its ability to be discussed without having an extensive, you know, meeting with, with this on top of a regular scheduled board meeting. So it may require a special meeting. So, Lane, you're muted. Sorry about that. One of the other things to point out is that the, um, the tech center um, has been asking um, to do something separate. Um, so that at the end of their first semester, which I think is January 22nd or thereabouts, um, that they wanted to try to go back to full in person. Um, so I would put that possibility on that next meeting when you guys are determining, you know, full in person for K to K to two or K to three, um, include that in there as well. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. Just to throw another wrench in the works. So should I amend that to say that we are, that we would vote to today to go to hybrid modality on the 14th and have a special meeting on the 4th to determine if we change to full in person and 
full in person on the 18th and the tech centers modality will be discussed then also. That sounds fair to me. Okay. Um, do we have a second for the amended motion? I'll second that. Any further discussion, comments, questions for Lane? All right, so we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of returning to hybrid modality on December 14th, um, and then uh, we'll discuss further on January 4th. Please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, so the motion carries seven to one. Um, so, um, Laura, so I believe there were two. Oh, I'm there sorry. I, I can't see all of, oh, okay, I didn't see. That's okay, Megan and myself. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, six two then. Okay, um, great, so Lane, we will, hear from you um, and in community messages and things like that. Um, and we will we will look forward to seeing what happens next. And um, thank you everybody, all these multiple people who listened in and commented and put things in the chat and, and, um, and thanks to all the board members. Have a good evening. Thank you.